Um, I guess a little bit of introduction from myself. So um, I'm Chris Ritson. I'm the Senior Risk and Uncertainty Consultant here at Safran Risk. And I joined a year ago this week, actually. Um, so previously, my career was in risk management. Uh, I've always been a risk manager, so day to day risk management, as well as the modelling side of things. And when it comes to Monte Carlo uh, career going sort of 13, 14 years, uh, highways, rail sector, major civil engineering, uh, cross rail, high speed two, uh, et cetera. Um, so I had an opportunity to sort of look at uh, Safran risk when I was looking at integrated cost and schedule risk analysis in the same holistic model. Um, and I found Safran risk to be the best tool. So that's a little bit of the background of me and how I kind of got into this. Um, and what I've, what I've actually done is I've actually created this slide deck. Um, and I think what we'll do is we're going to stick probably as much as possible to the slides because it covers quite a lot of ground in a reasonably logical order. Um, but at some point I might just get annoyed with the slides and just dip into the tool itself um, and in and out if necessary. So we're looking at some underlying basics um, from the sort of the schedule, the risk and the cost model. Um, so we'll be looking at importing projects, creating projects, customizing your schedule views and things, which uh, you know there's quite a lot that goes into the schedule part of the uh, of the tool. Um, and of course, the risk bit is uh, going to be of great interest to you as well. Um, and the, the, the cost integration, so all those things will get covered. So I'm going to just sort of start here with some real basics actually is that in the top right corner, once you get the tool open, uh, you see this kind of red ring that I've shown in the image there is what we call the burger menu. And underneath that burger menu, you will be able to find the latest version of the user guide. Uh, which is effectively, a, so I think it's like a 100 or 200 page PDF document. Um, you also find the, the folder. So that's an important thing to highlight to you. So if you do have any issues that are not from a, how do I use the tool? Because you can ask me those questions, but if you have an actual problem with the tool where it appears to be giving you an error message or something, um, then the log file will be recording all those error messages and will give our support team a clues to how to help you. Um, and you can also see at the bottom it says about Safran. So if you click on that, it will, it will confirm the version number of the software that you've got. So those things are important if you actually have sort of tangible problems, uh, errors, bugs, if they were to arise. And already reach out to you and you know they, they might even ask you to share the file that you're working on so that they can try to replicate it um, and you know then advise what you need to do um, so it's just worth pointing that out uh, but the, the the other thing here is underneath that log file folder is also some example files which you can play with um, which they're very simple you know they might only be 30 or so activities long or but they just sort of help you play with something that isn't a real project, but just just to get comfortable with using it, I suppose. Another thing is when you go through our sort of various tabs, uh, you'll see this sort of options cog. Uh, again, I've kind of put a red ring around that and that will be context sensitive options for whichever tab you are on. So if you're you know, in a schedule tab, it will be different to if you're in a risk register tab, etc. But that black ribbon you'll see in a moment is situated along the top of the screen and it's permanently there. Um, so that's kind of the main part of the user interface. Um, but if you ever see a little pin icon like this, then that's interactive, it's dynamic, so you can kind of pin things in place. So there's various windows that you might find uh, work for you and you want to have them pinned there. Uh, maybe some of them are just in your way and you don't, you don't need them, so just unpin them. But before we get into the user interface and the tool, I need to give you a little bit of background on what the tool is. It's sort of the essence of it. So Safran Risk is an application, um, but it's also uh, a database. So there's an underlying database that gets installed in the application. For you to have it on a server um, behind your company's firewall, and then you can all pretty much access the same information um, unless you sort of set up some user permissions and things. Um, when you're actually sort of 
engaging or putting information in and out of uh, Safran Risk, then typically the, you're going to need a, a project schedule file. So uh, I'm guessing you guys are using P6, um, so that would be a .xer format. You might have some subcontractors and things that maybe are using Microsoft Projects, so we can import those as a .xml file as well. But the third and final file type for project schedules is our own Safran project file type. So you can actually share .spx files uh, around with your team as well when using Safran Risk. Um, so Safran Risk or this sorry Safran project file is actually coming from the original tool that was sort of 20 plus years mature in the Norwegian oil and gas is comparable to P6. So if you've ever used uh, those kind of planning tools, you'll be fairly familiar with a lot of the terminology and you know the behavior of the sort of scheduling aspects. Um, but .spx is what we use. Um, so that's the so the first component is the sh project schedule, and then the next component is the risk model. So as you start building cost, risk, etc., um, then this can also be imported and exported as a single .xml. And the risk model will things like your global risk register, project level risk register, your calendar risks, your schedule risk mappings. So the various sort of um, well, the risk mappings to the schedule activities. Uh, also similar to any risk registers items to your cost model. Uh, any correlations from the correlation matrix and we've also got an advanced function called scripting. Um, so if you've written any scripts, then that will also form part of the risk model. But that's a fairly niche function, so it might not be something that all of you use or any of you use, um, but it's a function that we have nonetheless and it's captured inside risk model. Um, of those, you can actually individually import and export your global or your project registers, your your calendar risks and your various risk mappings. So those can come in and out of the, the system as individual files. However, just because it's easier, you might want to just set a whole bundle and your and scripts don't have that functionality. So correlations would potentially break if you didn't have all the component parts, which is why it's important to save it as part of the full risk model. Um, and scripts, uh, you can actually just copy and paste that. It's because it's just like a text, text file, text document. So it doesn't need its own sort of import export, I suppose. But there's some very basic concepts in um, you know where you can find extra help and also the kind of the essence of how the software is working in the background. Um, when you actually open up the, the software for the first time, you'll come to this kind of welcome page and you can see on here that you've got uh, part of the black ribbon that we mentioned earlier. You won't see it fully populated. Um, it fully populates once you've opened a, an actual project, um, but you can also customize which parts of that black ribbon you can see from the options cog that you can see on the screen there. Um, Once you have opened a project, the, the kind of the full black ribbon broadly looks like this. So what you've got is if you've used um, Primavera risk analysis, you, you'll be familiar with the kind of old sort of Microsoft style um, drop down menus and things um, as a sort of user interface. And it can get a bit difficult for non-users of the software to understand where you are in the process. So when they put together Safran Risk, they were very keen to make sure that there was a very obvious workflow where you could kind of see the breadcrumbs and other people that if you were collaborating with doing risk workshops with, you could sort of see where you are in the, in the building of the model. So that workflow uh, broadly looks like this, where you have the inputs on the left hand side on the black ribbon analysis options for how, you know how many thousands of iterations etc you want to run the Monte Carlo and then you've got your outputs on the right hand side so all the sort of traditional ones you expect from a Monte Carlo output sort of such as histogram s-curve tornado graphs drivers uh, there but also we've got a few additional ones that are just part of Safran risk such as sensitivity analysis by exclusion um, the scatter plot for your integrated cost and schedule analysis, which also covers something called JCL or joint confidence levels. So we'll explore that a bit later. Um, the distribution comparison for creating all manner of what if scenarios or um, just comparing pre versus post, um, etc. And you can save as many S curves as you like into that distribution comparison because it's a database. Just remember 
lots of files and things floating around the place, um, which you might with other tools. Um, so that's the the kind of the overall sort of structure in that ribbon. It kind of holds your hand in a way, so you kind of step through from left to right, um, and then that kind of helps you ensure you're building a quality model. So. Uh, you know, you can see that you've actually kind of covered each of the, the inputs and you can go through those with your team as part of a, a workshop and make sure that you kind of validate the quality of those those things before proceeding. And you'll see that there's actually lots of ample feedback mechanisms that are very visual for those that haven't seen the tool yet. OK, so just looking at importing a schedule then. <clears throat> so when you hit that button from the, the home screen to import, First of all, you're going to sort of see some of the kind of obvious things that you're going to expect to see. You know, where's the, the file location, etc., that you're bringing in from. You'll be able to choose the name that you save it as uh, within your database. There's a few options that you can toggle on and off here um, as necessary, but typically you're probably going to want to include all of them. Um, I like to highlight this one here. This is important. So a minimum planning unit that gets set here or set calendar units. Now you can choose you know, days and, um, and other options. So here, can't be changed data. So once you've kind of gone through this import process, it kind of gets anchored in place. So that might be important for you. Um, certainly it's important from my career where m maybe we were doing a big project versus that big project having very discreet and um, maybe weekend turnarounds with like possession planning on the rail network, for instance, where you might actually be more interested in minutes. So, you know, the setting the minimum planning unit to minutes and days will have ramifications for how it portrays and behaves later on. So it's just important to kind of point that one out. Um, you're also prompted here with a kind of option to overwrite what you've already got on the database or append or an update. I'm not going to spend too much time explaining this and I, I've, I'm sharing the slides with you and there's this whole bunch of text that I've just kind of copy, copied from the user guide. Um, so this probably will mean more to some of you than others. Um, it's not something that I tend to need to worry about so much because you've always got the ability to just go save as a different name and go this is version two or this is the next month. So you can always have multiple versions of, of, of the kind of iterative or iterated schedule being imported one after the other and save them as separate items in your database, or you've got these options here. Just let you read those and observe time because depending on how you want to use the, the software, you know, this this may or may not be relevant to you. But as you proceed with your schedule import, uh, you'll get all the kind of user defined fields. Um, that you're probably familiar with from P6. And this is the kind of the metadata that essentially will help you configure your layouts and the views of the projects. Um, and we'll, I'll show you how that, that works later. Um, a lot of the text fields, I mean, they can grant you up to like a thousand characters of freehand text. Um, and they go down to quite a lot of levels, you know, 25, 30 levels in some cases. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in there. And it, I think it's superior to what P6 has, I think. Um, I've not used P6 myself, so I'm not 100% not sure on that, but it'll be comparable to, if not better than P6. Um, and we've also got the outline code. So if there are work breakdown structures, which are essentially like a hierarchy tree, you can define those as well under outline code. And then when you come to uh, this tab here on the end, which is the, the risk, um, you, this is where you can do the mapping if you have already got three point estimates captured inside your P6 schedule. So you'll be able to open up the drop downs and then ensure that those are mapped. If for some reason you can't find them, it might be that where they're being stored in P6, maybe it's under um, uh, like a text field or something like this. And it, whereas you, you're hoping to find a number, typically a duration value, like three days, five days, whatever. Um, so there might be a reason for that, but it's not the end of the world because it will still get imported. It just won't get imported into the, these three uh, categories or, or fields. Uh, and you can just run a global change effectively. Uh, we call it assign fields where you run a formula. It just copy and paste it from one to another and then you've got it in the right place. So 
no need to panic if you can't find them in there. Um, so once the import has run, and hopefully uh, there'll, there'll be no issues, but once it's imported, you'll get the kind of the auto detection of all the schedule warnings. So clearly if you are importing, I don't know, a 50,000 line item schedule, created by many, many different schedulers who are, you know, maybe they've got slightly different approaches to working or something. Maybe there could be quite a lot of these schedule warnings and they'll automatically flag. And if you've used um, PRA, Pertmaster, then you'll be familiar with the kind of schedule warnings that that's actually talking about. So, you know, the relationships, lags and things, uh, constraints and whatnot. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail soon. But just to highlight that that will automatically uh, refresh. So as you sort of start making changes and edits to the schedule itself, um, those will automatically detect. So just to explain this screen, so if you're using uh, Primavera, which I believe you are, then this layout is relevant to you because it will default to this as part of the import process and you'll get these columns generated that say PV, which stands for Primavera. And it will show you the Primavera duration, the start and the finish date, and that then allows you to compare and contrast how, if any, uh, differences of interpretation between Safran's interpretation and the original P6 interpretation. So this is like a, a validation step, and it's there for your peace of mind and your self-assurance that the import process has been successful. And it, clearly there can be a multitude of reasons why maybe there are deltas and differences typically calendars but also um, one that might occur is simply someone making edits inside p6 and forgetting to hit the f9 button to recalculate um, so if it doesn't recalculate there but then you import it into saffron saffron automatically does all the calculations or refreshes the calculations i believe that's something that you can set off and you can manually do it but i think as default it's set on so it would detect those changes and then the, the layout goes a little further in that it shows you some green bars on the Gantt chart view uh, for the P6 um, interpretation versus you know the red and the blues uh, for the, the saffron. So it should be reasonably obvious to then kind of do a bit of error chain analysis and step back through to see and find where the deviation has started, if there are any deviations, and it will just help give you some clues. And as I said, it's it's for your peace of mind and self-assurance. So, you know, the, the screenshot I've got there is exaggerated to show you how it could look. Um, not not saying it will be wrong. I'm saying that it's, it's just there to uh, just as an extra tool. Um, and I think it's the kind of thing you'd have to probably run anyway if you were doing uh, using PRA, for instance, because PRA hasn't been updated and developed in several years. So whereas P6 is continually updated, so there can be deltas and differences for different reasons there as well. Um, but we don't have this automatically generated layout for any of your Microsoft projects or .xml imports. So it is just there for Primavera and I'd say 90% of our customers do come from a kind of P6 background so that, that's why we have it. Well once you've uh, done and you're so you know you're, you're satisfied that the import's been successful you're probably not going to want to keep looking at this particular layout with those columns and that Gantt chart so there's a, a drop down at the top there for layouts and you can change that back to one that you've created uh, earlier, one that you know works really well for you and your team, um, or just to a different one of the default ones that are provided in Saffron. So I'm going to sort of give you some idea now of uh, some of the other parts of the, the the scheduling tool. So that you know the, the schedule tab on the black ribbon, because this is what would sequentially happen first as you would import the process, sorry, import the, the, the schedule and things like this. Uh, before necessarily doing any of the other things. But you've got some options here that gives you some summary information. So if you just need to find, you know, or see a view of what, what's actually been included, you might find uh, that useful information. So you need to, you can see that there's a kind of underneath the sh overall schedule tab on the black ribbon. If you move over on the sub tab to project, and then there's a button there that says summary. There's also another summary which is back on the home screen, but 
it, it's it's a very high level and generic kind of summary um, and it's, it tells you a little bit on activities how many risks and how many cost element items you've got in your cost breakdown structure as well so i'm just going to sort of jump back a little bit to this screen so that was how you import typically from p6 but if you were creating a new project then just the wizard would look a bit like this so you'd go with say project uh, selecting the name description etc and again you've got that lowest planning unit or lowest duration unit and it can't be changed once you've sort of set this uh, wizard in, in in motion and you've concluded it so just be careful with that um, there's a few other things there you can see that there's calendar sets uh, resource use user fields and things symbol sets so there's a lot of extra detail uh, there that you guys can come up with something that works really well for your team and then ensure that you have consistency around so that that might be worth exploring as well um, but I'm going to just kind of keep moving through the process but it's something we can come back to if you want to talk more about it so there's various uh, scheduling options but a really important piece is what you might have called data date in Saffron Risk is called Time Now. So I've just kind of highlighted that as a, as a red ring there. And that Time Now can actually be changed uh, later on. Uh, that's not fixed in place, so that's all good. Um, but this is where you'd find it as part of the Create New Project process. And then once you've got it created, um, the overall kind of layout of that scheduling screen uh, is that you've got those sub tabs that I mentioned, you've got your kind of tabular information on columns on the left hand side as you've already seen the Gantt chart on the right with a timeline up just above that and at the very bottom you've got some details so and that details portion is also quite dynamic it can be uh, be changed to show other things and quite often just right clicking on any part of the screen will give you some other options as well it's worth pointing that out so <clears throat> Let's see, so setting defaults. So I think this is something that might be relevant to those of you that are either creating a high level schedule network of maybe just a few hundred activities and you know you want to build it for yourself rather than importing, um, then you might want to look at the default settings here. So under schedule and then the project tab, you can see on the right hand side, there's a button that says user settings and defaults. If you click on that, you can then start um, setting up things so that it just works a bit faster for you. So if you want it to have certain calendars or certain default durations every time you add a new activity, uh, that just this kind of thing, some basic stuff there. So it's worth just playing with that once you've um, sort of opened up your project uh, for the first time and just seeing what works well for you. But the views, so you can change the views quite a lot and I, I guess you could do this in uh, PRA as well um, but the bottom panel you can see I've highlighted it under the yellow kind of box so that previously was activity information you know is this a hammock or is it a um, an activity or a milestone and uh, maybe the constraint dates and things all that kind of detailed stuff was there previously by default but you can see that you can change what's on display in the yellow box by clicking uh, here on the buttons within the red box so if you go to the view um, tab you've got activity link information resource loaded information uh, showing this as a histogram and there's also the logic navigator which you might find quite useful and quite um, I guess diverse dynamic quite customizable so you can see there that we've got it set to link information so inside the yellow box you can now see predecessors and successors um, and then in that you can see it says column list just at the top of uh, both of those lists of predecessors and successors that's because you can actually choose uh, what are the individual columns that you see uh, in that view so you don't have to see type lag calendar split target early finish link and uh, and so forth you can make edits to those things if needed so there's a button there that says columns which is now in the red box uh, that will allow you to make edits and changes 
insert or remove columns as necessary. You could also just right click uh, on the on the columns that, or the headers, I should say, of the columns, uh, and you can make some edits and changes there too. Um, what am I showing here? Symbols. So symbols. If you right click in the Gantt chart and then click symbols, you can then start making changes to how the the, the visual looks on the Gantt chart. So I've got that set. As you can see, um, there's a legend just above the predecessors at the bottom of the screen, which shows and you can just kind of show what things, uh, you know, what, what do the symbols mean or what do the colorations mean, etc. in there. And that's fully customizable. You don't have to show everything in that legend. Um, OK, important point here when you start to look at views and, and layouts and things is there's a box I've highlighted on the top left corner that says outline view or group view. If you want to start doing clever things with your view and you want to see things by a work breakdown structure or maybe geographic or uh, chronological, anything your imagination can come up with, then you're going to need the group view button selected, which I believe it is as default, I think. Um, but then under the group properties, which is roughly in the center at the top, also highlighted by a red box, that's where you play, start playing with the order of things. So you click that and you would then be able to start saying, well, I want to see things ordered by first WBS and then I want it by chronological or subcontractor or, or some other user defined field. So there's a lot of um, versatility in, in that and um, it actually has some relevance to how you do risk mapping, uh, as I was just sort of alluding to, because it means that you can take a, a like an estimating uncertainty value and apply it to everything within a particular geographic region, or you could reorganize your data, slice and dice in a different way, and then map, uh, you know, a risk or an estimating uncertainty uh, to everything for for a different purpose, for a different reason. So it's very flexible. Um, so yeah, for instance. I didn't realize I had this, um, but if you have uh, like a user field here, which is just the generic text free user defined field, normally empty, but someone has actually gone through in P6 and they've added L, M and H, low, medium, high. They didn't have time to give you a full three point estimate, but they put L, M and H. So I've now reorganized my information, not by work breakdown structure, but simply by low, medium and high. So you can see that that column um, uh, in the center there is showing the L's, the M's and the H's and you can see that the nodes have changed so we're no longer looking at a WBS we're now seeing everything under H's and L's as well so that means just getting ahead of myself um, but it means in conjunction with other things like the filters which are now being shown that you can actually show whatever is pertinent for an upcoming risk workshop. So again, going back to my example where you might have several tens of thousands of activities, if you want to shrink down the scope of what you're about to talk about for the next hour with your team, because you've only got one hour of their precious time, you start playing with the filters like this. I just want to show it in this way, organized by WBS or low, mediums, highs, whatever. Uh, and I only want to show the testing phase of the project like I've done here through clicking that. Sorry, this is the thing. This is this is why I felt oh maybe I want to jump out into the, the live tool. Um, I'm still in the slides here, um, so I'm kind of on the rails. This is just an example of how you might set that filter up. Um, just click on that button in the filtering portion of the screen, and uh, I've got things there for the testing phase. Uh, but then when you move over on the black ribbon to the risk mapping, the power is that now I only see six out of 31 activities because I've filtered down to just the testing phase so I can only see <clears throat> those six but also you can see I've got my L, M and H as the nodes so now when I come to mapping and cascading uh, those low medium and high estimating uncertainty ranges it's very easy to just click on the node and all the child elements will snap to that clearly if this was a work breakdown structure or if it was by subcontractor I could have an estimating uncertainty specific to just that subcontractor because maybe we've used that subcontractor so we've got good how well they perform based on what they quote so that's where some of the power of uh, the, the global risks that I mentioned earlier 
uh, can come in as well because that can act as a repository, as a historical repository, as evidence for uh, future projects. So if you're running a project that's going to last for five, ten plus years, then that might be something you would like to investigate in, in using that. Um, but broadly speaking, that speaks to the power of this. And there's also even here on the risk mapping screen, you still got more filtering options available to you as well um, within this screen. So if you wanted to see even less, like maybe you've got 200 risks on your risk register, you could shrink that down and just show anything with the work, you know, the spelling of DES for design, and it will just show you anything with DES in the title of the risk. Um, so I think you'll find that really useful. Um, and I like to spend a bit of time just talking about it. And as I said, there's the, the extra filtering options with the blue arrow sort of pointing that out there and a few more red boxes have just popped up. So you've got a risk filter and also the um, <clears throat> those little squares within the red squares, <laughs> if you can see those. Um, I am sort of hovering my mouse around them. If you click on those, you'll find it pretty much behaves like an Excel spreadsheet in terms of giving you must, must uh, con So one of the other views is the logic navigator. So this is a little bit like the one we saw earlier, uh, which had the predecessors and successors, but now we're going for a bit more detail. So again, fully customizable, show what you like, um, but essentially you've now got your predecessors shown here, but underneath the selected one, you get all this extra detailed information. So in some ways, this might be the preferred uh, use um, for heavy users. Uh, very detailed users of the tool um, and you can, as I say, customize it show in terms of what it's showing. Excuse me, in the middle here it will show whichever activity you've actually got selected on this, you know, from the um, the schedule itself. So these are the predecessors of whatever is selected. These are the successors of whatever is selected. And again, you just got these kind of um, scroll bars and you can just go up and down those and see all the information and you can make edits in here as well which is very useful as well which is uh, prob probably good uh, clearly you can see there's a go to and a go to successor predecessor button at the bottom but equally i think you can just double click each of these and it will scale you up and down the ladder so, so to speak in the sequence <clears throat> so yes we covered that yeah I mentioned about and yeah, that's how you edit what's in the list and things. Just right click on those. Right, representing the schedule time. So th there's the timeline that's above the Gantt chart. Um, you can right click on that to bring up some additional options, uh, you know, to anchor it in place or move it around as necessary um, and make some sort of just changes to the, the, the visual aesthetic of it and the behavior of it. Uh, and zoom to best fit and things. Um, we mentioned about the time now as well, so that's under properties, um, which can be edited at any point. Uh, you can click and drag to move around, and you can also click click and drag uh, with your right button and your your left button will do different things in terms of zooming in and and just sc scrolling it, moving it around. Right, a little bit more on layouts. So there's a button there that's highlighted. Um, with the red circle at the top. When you click on that, you'll see all the different layouts that you've actually got. Now I've got quite a few there uh, for different purposes, and that's because I've configured different, you know, views. So that the the layout is a summarization of what which columns you've got on display, but also what did the Gantt chart visualization look like. So, you know, I can. You can see here in the, the one that's on screen now, just under the legend, it says PAT duration and timing. So there's a kind of salmon pink color that you can't actually see in here because it's probably not run the analysis yet or or more specifically it's mid analysis. I can see it says iteration 46. So because it's not concluded the analysis, there is no PAT calculated yet. It's mid progress. Um, so that would account for why you can't see anything in there. But um, that's just one of the changes I've made to this particular layout and I've also got a lot more information on which risks are impacting uh, during that iteration of the Monte Carlo, the random simulation sampling. But it's from this um, button here. 
that you can see all the different ones that you've created and saved, and then you can rename them, change them. Um, you can assign them to different uh, set, symbol sets and things. And this is how you make those edits and changes. And once you've got them how you like them, you might find that they, if it works really well for you, it might work really well for your team. So if you want a consistent approach to life, then you'll probably want to um, share it. Um, which you can do and I'll show you how to Oh, here we are sharing layouts. How logical was this? This is wonderful. OK, so on the schedule tab, if you go to file this time, you'll find an export button and there's layouts. So you'd be able to then, as I say, share email that across to your colleagues and then they can import that layout and it will work for them too. You can, so I know we already touched on this. Uh, you can manually make any adjustments to the schedule just as you could in PRA. Um, so you can change uh, things, if, you know, constraints. You could uh, change the durations. You can change the logic links. You can make any change that you like. As I said, it's a fully fledged, fully matured, comparable to P6 kind of a piece of software. Uh, in terms of scheduling. So all the things that you'd expect to be able to do, like just start adding new activities as well, you, you're free to do that. So just that's just uh, showing you the right click. If you were to right click into the um, into the columns, this is the, the pop up that you would have seen or the menu you, you would have seen. So I mentioned that the link. Uh, you can also do drag and dropping uh, as well on the Gantt chart on the visualization. Uh, if you prefer to do your, your linkages that way. Um, scheduling, logic linking. Yes, and when, when you are under like those logic navigator views and things, you can edit those links in terms of like, is it a finished start, finish, finish, etc. There's little drop down menus all over the place for these things. Resources. I should probably point out that if you've imported a schedule that is fully cost resource loaded, it will bring all of that in uh, to the, the it's into Safran Risk as part of the import process. However, if you want to, you can edit them inside um, inside Safran Risk, or if you're creating a new project from scratch, then again you could just build your resource table from scratch. Um, that that is also easy to do. You could, I don't know if I've got a screen for it in here, but you can actually change the um, the profile. So if you want to front load or rear end load the uh, the incurrence of cost, um, you can make uh, some adjustments to that as well. So this is all possible to do. And I will have to come back to talking about um, a resource loaded schedule uh, for cost modeling purposes. Um, a little bit later as well, because there's a couple of different ways that we offer you uh, to, to approach that. Um, but you can see that you could, once you've created your resource table um, from the sub tab, you could insert a column and then just easily select uh, which resources apply to each activity as necessary. And in case I haven't already mentioned it, uh, we allow you in Sahran Risk to go down to the minute when it comes to planning and scheduling. So if you use the sort of suffix of uh, M for minute, H for hour, D for day or W for week, it will recalculate and understand that. And that works on the risk register as well. So when you can see at the bottom of the screen, I've got a triangular distribution and I've got 15 days, five hours, three minutes. I mean, of course, depending on your calendars and things, that will probably shape, you know, some rounding up and rounding down. But if you are on a lowest planning unit of minutes, then it won't do any of that, will it? Um, but you have to make sure you're, I, I guess, um, uh, what's the word? That they embrace, it's not the word I'm looking for, but they, they've been set up with this in mind, uh, so they harmonise easily with it. Otherwise, you will experience some rounding up and down type errors and you can see there that it, I say error it's not an error but it's just rounding up and rounding down it's just what it is um, but that 15 days five hours three minutes will say round to 15.2 days or something like this this is why I said it was important so if, if you set the minimum planning unit to be um, days then when you start describing things in uh, minutes and, and, and hours it is going to give you this kind of rounded 15.2 days rather than showing it in the minutes. 
So that, that is the obvious consequence of having a, a, a minimum planning unit of days, but then describing individual components of your model in minutes or hours. So that's the kind of thing that it will do. And it, it, it's particularly important with respect to calendars because calendars will be set to uh, some planning units or other and therefore you know you need to make sure these things are all harmonized so if you're doing a schedule which does need to be calculated all in minutes just make sure everything including the calendars are dealt with in minutes and mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're all understood in that way whereas if you're doing a very long 10-year project days weeks might be totally sufficient so you know you you probably describe things in more in that kind of macro language um otherwise you start getting this rounding up and rounding down type thing which might create some kind of distortion is if you say that if you stipulate that the minimum planning unit is days then the software will always assume that if you type the you know the number five into the duration without giving it a, su a, a suffix of, of of um, minimum of minutes, hours, days, or weeks, it will always just assume you said five. Therefore, it must be five days. If you then come in and say no, it was five, and then M, it will auto calculate that as minutes. So, you, if you don't give it a, a value, it will always assume you meant the okay. the minimum value that was stipulated at the creation point of the project. Right, uh, sharing projects. OK, yeah, so I guess for the eagle eye of among you, you may have seen that when we did this screen earlier for schedule file export uh, for the layouts at the top of that menu was export project. So this is how if you needed to share the project for any reason, I'm guessing you won't have to because you're probably all going to be on the same server. But if you needed to share it externally, uh, maybe to say us here at Safran, maybe there was an error or something and you needed us to investigate for you, then you could export the project. When you click that button, you get the option there of do you want it to send it in a Safran project file or as a primavera.xer or as a Microsoft project XML. So you get those three options again um, as part of the export process. And if you are sharing the whole project, remembering that it's not just a schedule file, it's the risk model as well. So the risk model is here on the home screen on the on the sort of black ribbon tab. Uh, you've got the import and export risk model. So remembering that risk model is not just the risk register, but it's the global risks, it's the correlations, the mappings, the cost model, all of that other stuff. OK. So risk register so we're just kind of moved on to um, the project risk tab on the black ribbon now in here you've got the the ability to do import export via excel as previously described if you do do that then do make sure that you put everything in the correct column if, if that makes sense so like the columns will be formatted in a particular way that Safran the software understands it so if you try to import and export in different sorry import in a different order of columns or, or adding columns and things like it, it probably won't work um, so best thing to do here is create a dummy project or start one off and then Excel export it. And if you want to work inside Excel because you find it faster or, or more comfortable doing it that way, or maybe you're linking to an ARM database or something like this, then you know maybe that's the way to do it. And of course, you could then, if, you, if that's part of your sort of process, you've got to do this once a month, say, then it might be worth investigating uh, writing a macro or something that will you know, copy and paste things into the right columns just as a time saving. Uh, device I suppose um, but otherwise the risk register will be remain saved inside the database as you last left it so if, if it was a month ago you last ran your Monte Carlo then the risk register in ARM say if you're using a product like that will have updated over time whereas this will still be showing what it was last time you ran a Monte Carlo simulation in this product you know this database won't have changed so that's the kind of the interface I suppose that you consider doing otherwise you I guess you're just doing it manually um, via the, the, the normal kind of mechanism um, right global risk so I've talked a little bit about global risk already so you can see 
my mouse pointer, I don't know if you can see it wiggling around, but there's the global risk tab. Quite often that's a tab that you won't even have shown. You would go to your options cog and just have it hidden. You wouldn't even use it that often. You might maybe periodically set it up or, or update it uh, with additional historical actuals or um, maybe when I was talking to a, a different customer that they might want to consider using global risks as a means of communication. So you could be in charge of a supply chain where they are doing very detailed bottom up risk assessments, whereas you as a sort of client organization or project management organization might be looking at the top down generic assessment of risk. And what you might spot is that as time goes on, there's emergent themes which multiple subcontractors are reporting on. So you might then say, ah, OK, well, three out of 10 of the sub supply chain have noticed this emergent theme, but seven of them are yet to be made aware of it. So you could create your global risk register as a kind of um, uh, a communication um, tool where you then just Excel export the global risk register, make your updates and changes there. Like I as your client see X, Y and Z is happening. I think this is the kind of the assessment I would give of this kind of thing. Um, maybe you could review those global risks at your bottom up level and reassess them according to the nuance, according to your specifics on your project because your probability, your impact assessment ranges, your mitigation measures you know, like proposals might be different from the ones that we've got in mind. So that helps facilitate good communication, but it's also, as I mentioned, if you've got repeat risks, generic risks, maybe it's, you know, if you're looking at a work winning situation, you don't have much time to you know, start another risk register from scratch. Maybe you want to just bring over generic risks uh, to your next project. Uh, this could be a great way of keeping and storing those. Um, but also, as I say, subcontractors, supply chain, if you've got lots of historical performance information, you could use this as a, a means a repository of keeping track of that. So there's just a few ideas and then you can see that it's like a drop down menu and then there's a little button to the side of it saying include in the local project level risk register. So that, that's how I kind of envisage um, that being used. It's entirely optional, by the way, you don't have to use the global risk register at all. You can just just use your project level. OK, um, I suppose that the final thing to say about the global risks before I move on is that when you're on that tab, on the black ribbon, it looks exactly the same as the risk register. Exactly the same, same behavior, same, same data, same fields, same columns. OK, so the types of risk. Um, so that's the third column along risk type. Estimating uncertainty, standard risks and calendar risks. Those are the three different types that you can have. So what we've done with Saffron Risk as part of that kind of user interface and simplifying and streamlining the workflow is just to pull together all the risks into one place. Um, and this is how we've done it. So your standard risk event is, you know, a probability of an occurrence, you know, negative impact on your objectives, but it's an uncertain final outcome in terms of the expression of the magnitude or severity of, of the effect of that risk. Uh, whereas an estimating uncertainty um, actually has a, a probability which is kind of anchored in place. It's kind of greyed out. You can see on the screen, uh, roughly in the centre of the screen there, 100%. So these are things that we know are going to happen, but we just don't know what that looks like in the future, but it, we know it will happen. So it's a kind of known unknown. And you can kind of cheese the system. You can game it um, if you want. You can you can still put in like I've got one here, higher order uh, uncertain 10K to 20K units. That's got 100% probability, but it's in as a standard risk. Uh, and there's reasons why you want might want to do that, such as when you're correlating um, risks on the correlation matrix, um, you have to, it won't, include estimating uncertainties on the correlation matrix. So if you want to describe something as an estimating uncertainty with 100% occurrence, that would be the way to work around that. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then the final type is the calendar risk. You can see at the very bottom of my register, I've got a kind of a, a wind 
speed over 15 meters per second. Maybe you've got tower cranes or something and they can't operate safely for legal reasons uh, when the wind goes above certain speed. Um, so what you'll fire, I'm not sure where my slides go with this in a minute, but, um, but the wind that's dealt with, you create those calendar risks on the risk calendars tab on the black ribbon and you can have loads of those and you can share those across your projects as well but um but you've got the ability to do that and it's fairly similar to pra um however we've made some advancements some you know evolved it a bit you can uh, very easily create a new say calendar risk based on actuals uh, so if you have real life telemetry data from a weather station for say one year i'll show you how you can do that make it last for 10 years for an upcoming project um, an evidence-based approach is always good uh, and then there's a column there called probability in the red box uh, big sorry red red rectangle is in the center of the screen now um, that is what you would describe as the current probability or the pre-mitigated probability everyone's going to be different on the, with the semantics on this but essentially it's different from the post mitigated position or the kind of forecast position of your risk after you've implemented some mitigation measures. So that's what that is. Um, and then you can see also there's a column with bunches of colors. Those colors will be automatically applied if you add new risks manually inside this system, inside this tool. Um, if you were to add risks via the Excel spreadsheet, however, which I got a feeling you guys might be doing, um, then you would create your own color um, inside the Excel spreadsheet and it would just adopt the color. And if you use the same color um, for multiple risks, that's possible. So maybe if you're using ARM, say, and it has a probability impact matrix diagram, PID matrix uh, with, you know, greens, yellows, oranges and red risks, something like that, then you, you might just want to have some consistency and just show everything that's an amber risk because of other reasons that might not be financial, you know, it could be like a reputational risk makes it red, for instance, you might want to have that sort of distinction. Um, it's up to you how you use it. How we use it in Saffron, it's, it's fairly aesthetic. It's not really that important. It has some bearing on one of our outputs on sensitivity analysis, but it's really not the be all and end all. Um, nothing to really worry about. You don't even have to bother assigning colors if you don't want to. So, so I wouldn't get too hung up on it. Um, in terms of the distributions that we have inside the tool, we have nine, most of which you'll probably find most of your user cases in the left hand side there, you've got kind of the uniform triangle and beta per. You probably find 80, 90 percent of all your risks will easily be accommodated under those three shapes. We do have others, as you can see. Um, maybe trigen is going to be useful if you're in a risk workshop and you, you know your subject matter experts are telling you one thing but you're in the room and you can gauge the tone and the mood uh, and you can sm maybe smell a bit of bs and you maybe want to adjust it so you can put some uh, shaping on the extremes of what they are quoting you with the confidence values for a trigen um, and similar on split triangle but we've also recently added log normal um, as well uh, if that's useful to you um, if, if you want me to describe these um, any more than you know, just let me know. But what I will say about the discrete and the cumulative that are shown in a kind of more tabular form, you can see there's a button there that says add row. If you click add row, it will let you add up to 100 rows. So if you needed to replicate a different, um, maybe a subcontractor's S curve from one of their Monte Carlo models, you could do it down to the you know, the P1, the P2, the P3, if you've got the time and energy <laughs> to do that, uh, you could add 100 rows and replicate their curve perfectly. Um, other reasons why you might want to use those shapes. Uh, I mentioned earlier about scripting and how we've got some advanced functionality, fairly niche. You might want to use a discrete distribution and in conjunction with alternative pathways that you might create. So, in terms of your project sequencing, I've got an example that I can show you where I've used scripting to say our customer is going to order. We don't know how many units of our product and also our customer is global, so they might want us to just ship them down the road by truck. So we'll put in a number of days for doing that. However, they might need us to fly them out to somewhere in Europe 
which might then you know take a lot longer lots of bureaucracy red tape uh, customs etc so you might have a scenario where you no no longer ship them by truck but you ship them by air and you might want to put a probability distribution to, to determine which action are you going to do or which activity on your schedule so you can turn one of them to silent and go turn off and the other one to sort of have life breathed into it so you might have heard of this as uh, probabilistic branching or conditional branch uh, conditional branching um, so it's that kind of thing that you can do with those distribution shapes very easily uh, in conjunction with scripting so if, if you want to know more about that I can show you um, I, I guess it's said there in words on the screen but I've got most of those set to relative um, so that means they're shown or described as a percentage increase or decrease on whatever you've mapped it to so you can do that but you can also switch it to absolute which means you can define like in the top right hand corner it shows 25 percent probability of a 20 day impact so that's an absolute expression um, so you can go with pro probabilities or sorry percentages or absolute uh, cost impact or absolute duration impact <clears throat> okay so defining your distributions then so you've got the sh initial toggles there which are you know is there a schedule impact to this risk or is there a cost impact to this risk choose the shapes absolute relative from the drop down menus input the free point estimates as necessary and then as i said you've also got a, a post mitigated position and you can expand that um, and you'll see some additional information it's basically the same information again plus some uh, you've got the option of looking at the activities the mitigation activities uh, but you've also got under this kind of purple section the mappings so there's a little summary that this risk is mapped to uh, different parts of the cost model or different parts of the activity schedule so the cost model being that first one that says additional parts and you see there's a little circular symbol like a coin that's the cost model and all of those other ones are activities they're kind of gantt chart bars as indicated by the little rectangle there's also a little space at the bottom for freehand text notes if you need to substantiate why we picked up a certain probability or certain range or shape etc but we can't ignore this thing here so this was right at the top and you might have uh, kind of skipped over it but there's a little toggle here that can have quite big ramifications on your modeling in terms of the correlation factor so if you have multiple activities uh, mapped to this or cost elements in as another one um, how how, it, how they behave can be toggled here so as an example as you go through step through the random iterations one two and three of Monte Carlo if you do not select that and leave it blank then that essentially means that every uh, say activity that is mapped to that risk will all suffer the same magnitude um, or not at all if the risk does not occur so you can see here activities a b c all suffer 93 percent impact then iteration two none of them suffer anything iteration three they all suffer again but this time to a new randomly selected 120 percent whereas if you had selected it and allowed them each of them to be independently stressed by the Monte Carlo then A does not B does but it's only 90 percent whereas C also does but this time they get 110 percent and so forth so that's the, the the impact that that's having on the model so it's quite important uh, and it will lead to things like this sort of double hump shape instead of a kind of more evenly or uniform distribution not, not uniform but a normal distribution type shape and um, so it's very important to highlight that as part of your modeling so um, I mentioned about the post mitigated position so once you sort of open that up you've got the kind of uh, the action toggle so if you select yes I'd like to put in some actions you don't have to you could just describe the post mitigated position without even looking at the actions but the uh, safran risk actually has a fairly powerful little uh, feature here which essentially allows you to add duration activities or cost activities um, and then you can sort of describe a mitigation uh, both in terms of where is that going to be effect where, where's the effect of the mitigation measure felt on the model so you can link 
that we're going to book a venue for an optioneering presentation that's going to cost us five thousand uh, pounds but it's also going to take us two extra days it's not part of the original deterministic plan to do this it's a pr mitigation proposal so you say it's going to take two extra days on the finalizing of the design activity so you can get a drop down there to map it to the activity you can also map it to a particular cost breakdown structure element from the cost model as well um, and that that means that later on when you run a post mitigated model it will incur the cost of five thousand and two extra days in the post mitigated model so this allows you to start looking at whether or not it was worth implementing those measures through a few different ways but principally this kind of cost benefit analysis uh, can be sort of really elevated i find if you use this extra toggle here which says alternate the position based on action so what happens here is if we select that you get two new um or two-step probability question first of all what's the probability that we're even going to execute this mitigation measure so just because it's been proposed doesn't mean it has to be delivered on so for instance a subcontractor can make a proposal but the client has to accept may be in a position where they have to fund it or something and maybe they don't want to um, so what you can do there is say mm, I made a proposal but it's kind of 50 50 and then even if we did make this uh, proposal and it was executed maybe it's not proven therefore it, it may not succeed so you can say 80 percent of the time it we think it should uh, succeed but 20 percent of the random iterations it won't and that's exactly what it's doing is essentially if you're running a five thousand let's say one thousand iteration model then this mitigation measure will be implemented executed 500 times the other 500 it will not so 500 times that is a pre-mitigated position 500 times it'll migrate to a post-mitigated position but before it can get there it first has to then answer the second question which is is it successful or not so of those 500 80 percent of those will be successful and those will uh, move forwards to the post-mitigated um, situation but 20 percent will be kicked right back to the pre-mitigated because it didn't work so you, you've incurred the cost of trying to mitigate it but then not succeeding so you don't get the reward necessarily you don't get the benefit of the of the intent of the intended measure you've got the power to do that which kind of blends together your pre and your post mitigated in a single model rather than running an exclusively pre versus exclusively post mitigated again it's entirely optional you're, you're I'm not saying you have to do that it, it's just there and I found that as a practitioner a very interesting and welcome additional tool um, and you can kind of use it to see the effect of opportunities that you know uh, via the sensitivity analysis and things like this um, which comes out later on um, but by the same token you know this is also useful for not just mitigation but if you're thinking of opportunities then your pre-mitigated position might look like this no effort expended therefore no reward therefore there's no schedule impact or, or any cost impact so zero probability of opportunities randomly just popping into life and giving us <laughs> um, whatever it is we desire and enhancing our objectives um, whereas here your post-mitigated position you actually define what the actions look like how much they're going to cost and then you can then measure the you know the, the post mitigated benefit using that alternate position based on action to understand that payoff um, so this is how you would uh, write or define and articulate an, an opportunity inside the risk register so when you are defining that distribution shape you can see at the bottom i've gone with a, just a triangle it's relative um but notice that it's all of those three point estimates are all below 100 percent. so that means that there will be a 50 most likely a 50 percent saving on whatever duration of activity has that's been mapped to so if it, if it was a 10-day activity then the, the opportunities it will take five days plus or minus because you can see i've got a min and, and a max in there as well so that's one way of articulating an opportunity of course you could switch it from relative percentage to absolute values in the drop down and then you could stipulate no i want this to be you know at least 30 days saved or most likely 50 days saved and and so forth so you can it depends on how you mathematically express it and then that's how you get an opportunity so we don't 
describe things um, in the risk register as being explicitly uh, threats and opportunities and issues. Um, it, it depends on how you've expressed them. So I, I think that the thing I haven't said is that just in case any of you haven't spotted it and you're kind of going, well, but where's the risk owner or where's the mitigation owner? When's the deadline for completing? That's day to day risk management and that's not the focus of this tool. This tool is all about quantitative analysis, QRA. Um, so it, it doesn't really concern itself with all of those other things, because once you get into that kind of Pandora's box of how do you best manage risk, that's a much broader topic with arms and legs and it walks off the table. And everyone else has got their own opinions on how to do that. So the user interface here has been very much streamlined when it comes to the risk register to just talk about what's the bare bones minimum that people need to be able to do sensible you know, decision making on cost benefit analysis and things like that for, for through the means of quantitative uh, sort of analysis. So we do have uh, another tool in production at the moment, or it's just we just concluded the second round of beta testing called Safran Risk Manager. So that's not the topic of today's training, but just for your awareness, we have that um, coming out towards the end of this year. Um, and there will be future integration with that tool, um, kind of compatibility and so forth, uh, where you can then express your risk register in terms of reputational impact and all those other kind of things that you might do in an ARM database, for instance. But we're gonna, we've got a different vision for what we want our product to be and, and how, how it works. And um, if you want to know more about it, I guess speak to me outside of the, the training and I'll, I can talk a little bit more if you prefer, if you're, if you're interested. Um, but I'm very much into the realm of uh, looking at complexity science and understanding how uh, risk in the future is going to be done differently. And in my personal belief, we'll be looking at relationships between things and such. So uh, that requires different tools to the ones that we've been using thus far, which are frankly inadequate. Um, so but anyway, this is a completely different topic. So risk calendars then. So this is a screenshot from a different tab on the black ribbon. Again, this is one of the ones that you probably will hide most of the time, but occasionally you want to create one of these calendar risks and have it as something you can select on your risk register. Um, so for anyone that's done calendar risks in the past, then uh, in PRA, uh, or per master, uh, this will be fairly familiar. Um, perhaps this, I'm not sure, I can't quite remember how it looked, but I think the visual feedback here is quite nice that you can select your distribution shapes and you can see, um, like in this purple um, distribution shape, how that uh, is being interpreted by the software. So it just gives you that extra sort of validation uh, comfort, I suppose. But the three different types, broadly speaking, are the periods of blocks of downtime, the weather windows of downtime. I keep saying weather. I, <laughs> a calendar risk doesn't need to be about weather. It really does not. But it just so happens that it's a really easy way to explain the concept. So I, I might slip uh, by talking about weather quite a lot. Um, and then the other one is periods of probability of downtime. So you can assign individual periods a probability value and it will just express that during the Monte Carlo. Um, but the first type period of blocks, you've got two variables essentially. So you create a period of time that you're interested in and then how, so I'm going with the example of um, a storm season. So maybe it's a, how many storms do you typically experience within an annual storm season? And you might express that as one, two and ten using a beta per distribution, something like this. So it's most likely to be one or two or three, um, maybe not so much towards the 10, but 10 is possible, it's plausible. And then the second question from this column is number of blocks. So this means how many days worth of downtime would you get if a storm uh, was to occur? So again, that can be an uncertainty distribution of between we've gone with zero, one and three days. So your storm might give you downtime of up to three days if it's particularly severe. So it's two different questions, both being probabilistically analyzed there. The second type is the window of downtime. So this is where you're expecting something um, annually, perhaps, or, or maybe just in a partic one particular year, and you're expecting it to cause downtime on your, you know, your working. So it could start, early as or most likely as or late as 
and then you just describe and articulate the, the end time of the period, which again is also an uncertainty. So effectively free point distributions on start and end date of a particularly large or long lasting event. And clearly you can just add as many of those as you need as necessary. Uh, and then the final type that we mentioned here was that you could sort of just go, I'm guessing that the period of this time here, which is the beginning of January to the end of January, 25% and you, you just going with gut feel perhaps. But that's where if you're into the realm of what you might describe as continuous data, then if you happen to have it, then why not use it? Why not use a real life example? So you actually find this under the um, the sample data, um, which I mentioned at the very start from the burger menu. Go to the um, open the log file folder. We've got some sample data there, some sample projects. This spreadsheet's in there. Um, but what you can do with this is if you've got the actual real life telemetry from a weather station, for instance, uh, wave height, wind speed, and and these kinds of things just add a column and then you know put in a formula that says if greater than x then one if not then zero and just that simple logic one logic zero is enough information if you were to copy and paste just those two columns the time stamp or time period as it's called there and a was there downtime yes or no just copy and paste those two columns directly into saffron risk it will create um, a monte carlo a, a weather calendar for you. And the reason I say Monte Carlo it for you is, I don't know if you can see uh, in the bottom right of the screen, it says length, 10 years. What if that sample was one year's worth of data? Well, here you can extrapolate it and it will use this as the inspiration and then it will Monte Carlo put some natural variation on that so that it is, um, can be recycled and reused for the next 10 years or the next 10 years worth of different projects. So, you know, your central office could create that for one geographic area like L London, or if you were doing oil rigs out in the sea, you know, the particular area, um, then it'd be pertinent for that. And you'd be able to share that for any project that's in that same geographic area. So it's just worth pointing that out. It's quite, it's quite a neat function. So the real time analyzer. So this, this, this thing here, this screenshot is actually coming from um, the risk mapping screen. I'm actually going to come out of, of the slides because I think this is going to be better served if we're actually inside the tool itself. Um, let's see, risk mappings. OK, so at the moment I've got this set. So we already kind of saw a sneak peek of it when we were doing the filtering and the layouts and we were changing it. But I've got it set at the moment, so it's work breakdown structure. OK, so you've got our prelims, design, fabricating, constructing, testing, and, and then final testing and handover. Um, so it's a very simple project. So it's barely 30 activities, I think, in this schedule. Um, and then you've got your risk register shown across the top, including kind of the weather downtime risk, um, as described a moment ago. We've got some low, medium and high estimating uncertainties. So just to give that a little bit more um, colouring, um, you know, my, my low estimating uncertainties are just beta per distributions, plus or minus 5%, very natural variation on, you know, routinely done tasks. So high levels of confidence, uh, but low un and therefore low uncertainty, okay? I mean, you might then, as part of medium uncertainty, move to a triangle shape where you're starting to uh, send more of the random iterations towards the extremes. You can also start playing with, you know, the extremes so they're no longer uh, symmetrical, they're more skewed. And then finally, with our high, for demonstration purposes, I've just gone with a uniform. So maybe this is for um, an activity sometime in the future. It's like four years into the future. We have no idea. We're not arrogant enough to know what the most likely is going to be. So we've got an idea. It's in the schedule as part of the deterministic program, but we're going to plus or minus that by 20% could be you know, quicker delivered sooner than, uh, but maybe 50% overrun potential. So that's broadly what I've got going on in the background here, just for your information. And then when you come to mapping, you can see that I've got my low, medium and high they are on the left hand side of this kind of um, solid grey line, so it just helps organise the information a little bit better. Um, but it's also going back to one of the points I made very early on that someone asked, can you edit the three point estimates in the schedule? 
So I said the answer was yes, and I and I also said that that was kind of like the traditional method, but that if you were on a project like my last one with tens of thousands of line items, that we just don't have time to create a free point estimate for each individual line item. So this is where this method comes into its own because it means that you can open up, say, construction phase and say, actually, everything's going to be done in a factory. It's going to be low uncertainty, therefore. Um, so I'm going to click on the construction phase on that node to low and all three of the child elements beneath it snap automatically to that. I might then reconsider uh, and maybe do a workshop with my team and then they say, oh, wait a minute, no, connecting fuel and engine systems, that's exactly kind of tricky. That maybe is more in the high zone. We're, we're, in, we're not so sure. So you've got the ability to very easily cascade the effect of one risk or one uncertainty range uh, to many things underneath a work breakdown structure or it could be by subcontractor or whatever it might be. So it's very intuitive and easy to do and very visual so people can see what's going on on screen quite easily as well. Um, <clears throat> and as we start, if we go to say, the one that I like to use is locating subcontractors and suppliers. So I've got this uh, here showing the schedule impact and I've got the duration uncertainty is high I've got external communication risk, 40% probability in this shape distribution. I've got design spec change, internal communication issues. I can scroll along. I've got e even one more risk here, subcontractor liquidation, low probability, 5%. So all of those things there then compound together on the bottom right of this screen to show me that what we call the real time analyzer. So this is a 1000 iteration Monte Carlo and it's showing me the black line is my um, deterministic. So this should be a 40 day long activity, but it could be as low as 32 days or as much as 97 days. And I've got the mean of that shown as 52. Um, here's the power is that as I start adding new risks, you can see in real time that reruns 1000 iterations instantly. And then you can see that that's changed the shape well, maybe not so much the shape, but it's extended the worst case and also the, the minimum um, <clears throat> best kind of outcome has also been truncated somewhat as well. So you get that real sense with your team of how are the way we are building the model? How is that really having an effect? And you get that kind of instantaneous feedback. So, you know, other things might be or an example might be if, if your activity only has three days deterministic, but you have you, you witness seven months worth of impact, that would be an anomaly that would flag up before you run the model. So that means your team would spot it, hopefully, as part of the kind of the creation process, and you would have more confidence that once you have run the model together, um, that because you've gone through this kind of process of validating the shape and the, you know just saying does that feel right you know just my intuition my gut feel does, is, does this work is it realistic so as you do that it means that you trust the output when you finally come to running the full Monte Carlo later is what my kind of my pitch and my belief is on on this uh, it's, it's definitely the as a sort of practicing risk manager it's my favorite part of the whole tool um, it's because it's clearly designed for collaboration in mind and it's because it's so visual and hopefully you know we're all doing uh, virtual streaming you know screen sharing at the moment so th this can still work really well for you and your teams at the moment even with lockdowns and things like that um, <clears throat> if you click on this little sub tab here for the for the risk then you can actually see the impact distributions and probabilities and things that were defined on the risk register. You've got the ability to click override. So let's say locating subcontractor supplier. So that's an external communication issue. And lo and behold, we've got an external communication risk on our register. We might then decide as a team that the subject matter experts description of the impact scenario is not adequate for this particular activity in the schedule. Maybe this activity is way more sensitive, so you'd click the override button. Maybe you would change the probability, maybe not. Maybe you would change the distribution shape and got maybe a different shape entirely. It could be any of the nine 
but that, that's the point is that you can say, well, no, this is more sensitive. So the other activities may suffer to this amount, but this activity would suffer more or maybe less. Maybe it's more robust, more resilient. So you've got that ability to finesse uh, the model behavior with the override button. And for those that were sort of, um, you know, heavy users of uh, Permaster PRA, uh, that do these impact in series or in parallel is a very relevant question. So if we take the example of what we got here, we've got 97 day impact. You know, you could have been in a situation where these were all switched to in series. So the impacts accumulate one on top of the other if they happen to randomly occur at the same time. If you now click on the schedule impact, that's doubled. Yeah, you can see 199 days is now the worst case sampled by 1000 iterations. So do these things impact in series or parallel? How does that look in terms of how will that affect the model? Now I can see very quickly and easily um, without having to rerun it. I don't have to make any new files. I don't have to risk impact to schedule and create pre and post and all that kind of stuff. So it's very intuitive and easy to do in here. So if you want to go with the more traditional method, then if you click in the options cog, so the options, as I said, the cogs are sensitive to whatever screen you're on. So here I've only got options for this screen. Um, and if I could change estimating uncertainty from using risks from the risk register to use activity uncertainty, the view will change. And now I've got my distribution min likely max. So if you want to have this as your approach, you're free to do so. I would just point out that under the current version of the software, you can't edit the 30 day, 90 day, 150 day or the, the shape distribution here. You, you would have to go back to the, um, the schedule tab itself and make those edits here. OK, but when you're on the risk mapping screen, what you choose here as your option tells the Monte Carlo what to use as the input value. So if I if I have it set like this, it uses this. If I change it back to the risk register, it now uses the risk register items, these low, medium and highs. It's, it's one or the other. Um, I think the development team might be working on a kind of blended approach where it, it, you can choose on a per activity basis. Um, but for the moment, this is how it works and behaves. So it's just important to sort of make that clear. Um, you may also notice under the options cog that you've got a kind of which mitigation position you're looking at pre or post and, and such because you might find that a risk mapping breaks uh, depending on the mitigation position pre or post. Um, so you could have scenarios where there is no mapping, for instance. So it's, um, there is a button at the top here that says convert uncertainty, so I should probably just explain that before moving on. So the schedule has three point estimate or some three point estimates. And if you click that button, maybe you want to use um, the information that's already provided and you don't want to lose it, but you do want to migrate and evolve towards using the this method here with the risk register. So if you click that button, it will detect what it can find in terms of estimates and shapes and if you hit this button create risks it will then add those to the risk register and then automatically map them which then allows you to continue using this kind of evolved uh, practice rather than st sticking with the traditional so you get kind of the best of both worlds i suppose if you to do that so um, um which is if you were to click say on the weather downtime risk in the top right i click on that it filters to show me only the items where that risk has been mapped and applied. So you can see the ticks are in, over here. So I can have a quick glance at that. In flight, in flight, in flight, final on site testing. That's also going to be flying the, these uh, drones, that unmanned aerial flying vehicles um, on a disused airfield somewhere. So that weather risk will definitely affect probably just these things because everything else is indoors. It's just design activities and it's um, manufacturing indoors, but test flying definitely a weather risk. So it's a very easy, straightforward way to uh, see at a glance uh, where you've mapped the risks, which I quite like as well. And similarly, if you were to scroll along the top here, so this is the, the total project. Um, you can see that there's a blank square there. Someone might then go, oh, hang on, you've not mapped a risk. Is that intentional? 
or is that an accident? Should that have a mapping? And you go, oh, all right, fair enough. You come down here and you create the mapping that it should have had. So little things like that just helps uh, validate the model a little further. OK, um, I realised actually that we my slides didn't really go into any detail on the schedule warning, so we should probably just rewind slightly to that. I mean, I did I did say that this tab was automatic in terms of its uh, detection of issues and the issues that it's looking for are broadly in line and same as the ones done by OPRA. So if you click the options cog, you can select which ones to check for, and these are broadly the same ones that OPRA was looking at in terms of constraints, lags and relationships, you know, predecessors and, and such. The only one of these at the moment that can be changed is this uh, percentage of lags. Um, so if you make that 20 percent, because it's dynamic and automatic, though that threshold's no longer been breached by two of them. So that's now dropped off the report. And if I put it back to 10 percent, they come back. Um, but how you use this report, you've got a hyperlink in here. So you want to drill down, go back to the schedule. It will take you straight back to that item. Uh, it describes what the problem is that's you know worthy of your consideration. You then have an option to accept or reject, I, I guess, uh, by not accepting or rejecting, um, so that you can facilitate a bit of communication. Now, who you're communicating to is a, is a very valid question. So I, I envisage at least two scenarios for this. One is you don't have the time to send this back to the schedulers. Maybe you would like the schedulers to make all these amendments on the actual schedule itself, but maybe there's just no time. So you have to make all the edits your, yourself directly in Safran Risk, which you're fully able to do on the schedule tab. However, what you might want to do just to help um, memorize what it was that you did and why you did it, you can just freehand text, add in some notes. I am going to make this change for these reasons. Um, and then as you build up that report, you can then hit the export, hit to Excel, and then you can attach that as an appendix to a future QSRA report that you that you draft uh, without having to double handle the what did I do? What were the caveats? What were the changes I made to the model? Sorry, to the schedule file that I actually received. So this will help with that discussion in that way. Alternatively, it is the no, I do have time to wait. Um, I'm going to describe all the problems, why they're problems and why I want the scheduler to, to make those fixes on my behalf. So you then describe what it is you want them to do before you accept it and then you hit export and email it off to them. So there's, there's, those are the two broad cases for how you might use this. Um, but is, is there any, I think it does pretty much what it says on the tin and this is an area that will receive some um, development um, and it will, you know, be enhanced in the coming year. Um, I highly suspect I did hear my chief technology officer uh, just before I came on this call describing that this is something they're definitely prioritising to improve, but this is how it is at the moment. And I, I believe it's comparable, if not slightly better than the one that was in PRA. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt, if you start making the changes and fixing things, then this little schedule warnings thing will drop down. It'll go from two to one and it will drop off the list entirely. It will disappear and that's why I said make the notes first, export it, then make the changes because otherwise you lose that, um, you know, that, that uh, audit log, I suppose, of all the things that you've done, all the good stuff that you've done to improve the model to make it fit for purpose because clearly you can't run a, a QSRA with lots of, sh uh, say, constraints and things. It will tend to skew the, the outcomes. OK, um, I think we'll be so we talked about project risks. We talked about uh, risk mapping just then uh, cost. I think I'm going to dip back to the slides for this because it will probably do a slightly better job. Um, <clears throat> so. Modeling, OK, so when you're modeling costs, you've got two approaches, a kind of A or a B, as I've sort of just described here. So method A, again, this is kind of more the traditional, maybe what you've used to been doing in the past where you have a cost or resource loaded schedule. Now that's perfectly fine. We accept that and you can uh, model that as necessary if that's what you want to continue doing. We do however offer alternative which is method B which is there's a 
cost tab or module uh, where you can articulate and define your own cost breakdown structure. And anecdotally, I prefer method B um, to, to method A. I think method A, I rarely, if ever, saw done in any of the projects in my career because it just it seems to be such a large undertaking for the, the, sh the schedulers in conjunction with the cost estimators and to do it right and to try and make some um, maybe square costs fit into round scheduling holes. Uh, it doesn't quite work for them all the, all the time, so it's very difficult to do. So when I came across Safran Risk as part of my trialing on my last project, and I discovered that this kind of ability to make a cost breakdown structure and then pro rata and apportion costs uh, to certain activities in a different way, it was very intuitive and very easy to do. So I do prefer method B, but you've got the option of going with method A. What you can't really do at this point is both. You can't kind of, you have to kind of define as part of your risk management plan, are you going to go with method A or B? I, I wouldn't recommend attempting to do both, but uh, but you, you could probably cherry pick some elements. But yeah, broadly, when you're looking at the outputs, um, so when it comes to some Monte Carlo S curves, histograms like this, you'll see there's a very um, obvious um, step in choosing what it is you're looking at. So if you're using method A, then you can see the red hoop on the schedule button of the histogram. So this means that you can see the finish date, the start date, duration, and then I've just circled in red hoop at the bottom cost. So these are the costs associated with that particular activity or schedule. Um, and it's not using or being influenced whatsoever by anything you've put in the cost breakdown structure. So it's only cost loaded and resource loaded type elements or maybe risks from the risk register that have cost. Um, that's the, that's all you're getting with method A in that output. Whereas if you click on B, you've got the blue hoop with the cost. Now you're, you, you can see that this uh, portion of the screen, which was previously the like hierarchy tree of the schedule is now the cost breakdown tree uh, hierarchy instead. Um, so you, you get a completely different view and focus area of those. So very important distinction that I have to make uh, for you all to understand. Um, if I've not made that clear or you're still a bit confused, um, please ask or, or ask after the training. OK, so on the black ribbon on the cost tab, so this is what we sometimes call the cost module. Um, you can articulate the cost breakdown structure. So how do we do that? This button here, grouping. This is where you create your outline structure for your CBS, and you can manually do that in here um, in the grouping button. And in there, you could, as I don't, I'm not aware of any limitations on how deep the, the hierarchy tree is that you create, and you can assign coloration and things to the, you know, the different nodes and things in, in there. Um, so I've mentioned the import export button. OK, so once you've created your CBS, uh, any node that you've then selected, if you then hit the add cost button, uh, it will then insert a new cost element underneath that that node on your CBS. Uh, you can see that I've got a very simple one on screen there with materials, labor, other and underneath materials. You can see I've got sand, wood, concrete, mortar, etc. So th that's how you add uh, individual cost uh, elements or line items. Um, and you can probably see underneath that there's a whole bunch of information which we'll go through in a moment. But <clears throat> there's a button there that says regroup. And I was confused uh, initially as to what that was doing, but apparently this is something to do with the database. Um, sometimes if you copy and paste or maybe drag and drop a cost element because you added it under materials, but really it should have been under labor. Um, sometimes the database doesn't re-render the screen correctly or you come back to it and you can't see something that you previously added. If you hit the regroup button, it kind of forces a refresh of the screen. Um, and it's just an issue that we seem to have with this one particular uh, tab um, in, the, in the tool. Um, so I, I guess my advice is if you can help it, but avoid using the drag and drop in, altogether and just add a new item and delete the other one if it's in the wrong place I, I, is my recommendation. And then you shouldn't experience that problem. But if you do, for whatever reason, then hit just hit regroup sh should sort you out. If it doesn't, then talk to our uh, support team with the Safran at support email. Um, <clears throat> so this this last one here is the variables. Um, now, 
this is the thing for me that brings Safran Risk closer in terms of um, uh, capability with something like at risk if you've ever used um, that or model risk or any of the other Excel spreadsheet based approaches to doing Monte Carlo. Um, so this allows you to define um, something that in itself has an uncertainty distribution which when you map it to other things in your cost model it will cascade the effect of that variable from a, like a central place across the whole model or at least the cost model. Um, so as I said, th this is the thing that you know it can govern and shape different what if scenarios and things like that. It just gives you a, a way of playing with your model and um, trying to probe it and understand the way it works. Or, or, or I think we'll show some examples later uh, where I've got um, what if delay pe penalties, things like that. So you can do all kinds of things, which I'll get to. <clears throat> so I guess one of the main reasons you're here is you've probably done um, cost modeling, Monte Carlo modeling somewhere, and you've probably done schedule risk modeling somewhere, but you maybe have seldom ever linked both holistically in the same model. So th these next few slides are going to try to attempt to explain that. Um, but before I do, I might come out and just go into the tool itself for a moment, because I think we should probably spend some time on the columns, and what, what they're doing. So, <clears throat> OK, so on screen, I've got my cost breakdown structure. I've got some materials and other uh, costs and things. <laughs> OK. So. You can choose what columns are on display with this little button in the top left corner. If you click that, I can take ID off. For instance, and then I've got my base price. Uh, and I can stipulate a, you know, a value, £240 or £170. I can then also articulate an uncertainty distribution using any of the nine uh, shapes that you saw earlier, and whether that's going to be absolute percent, uh, sorry, absolute values or relative percentages. And I've then got the same ability to, to put in the quantity and an uncertainty on the quantity. So you've got price uncertainty and quantity uncertainty. And it will summarize the kind of deterministic position here in the base times quantity column and give you the total project costs. And so it's showing 10.99 million uh, over here. So that's our deterministic position. Uh, clearly, this is going to get Monte Carlo and stressed by uh, various factors later. Um, but it's building up a picture down below in the histogram and um, so the portion that is shown up is as amber or orange in the, the histogram at the bottom there is the, the bit that's selected from the model so that's the total labor costs from the node if i click pmo and click on time this time that's the proportion of that cost element design house so you can sort of easily quickly see how much of a i guess impact that is uh, and this is just the deterministic cost, by the way, so this has nothing to do with Monte Carlo yet. If we were to run Monte Carlo with the step through on, then this would uh, move around. You'd see that sort of changing. Um, but you've got the, the, these columns then, so you've got your base price and uncertainty, quantity, uncertainty, etc. Then you move into the schedule connection and how that works. And then you finally got the risk register uh, item, so you can sort of click in here and then select from the risk register uh, which risks would apply. So this is another mapping screen, but this time for cost, um, where there's a cost impact rather than a schedule impact. And what you're getting, you might recall that our risk register was maybe 14 or so risks long, but I'm only seeing about four or so in here, but that's because I'm only seeing the risks that have a cost impact. So it's truncating the view of the whole risk register. Um, there's another column that you can't see, which is on the very far right hand side, but it only shows up during the step through analysis, which gives you the kind of um, what was the iteration cost, excuse me, for each line item as you step through the Monte Carlo. So uh, that's the kind of broad overview of, of the uh, of, of the cost model, but just to explain this cost connection, then the linking cost to time. So first of all, you need to hit this button here. There's a toggle for schedule connection. And when you open up that 
um, when you click on the activity to select the activity, you can select one activity or one hammock or multiple activities. And what you'll be forced to do at that point is it will uh, default to say that 100% of all the costs are going to be against the first initial activity. So and it will then put 0% to every subsequent activity. So it kind of forces you to think, you know, how do I pro rata spread that cost around? And then as you do that, and once you've done that, you can see on the sort of right hand side that these then auto calculate a proportion based or a day rate based on the duration divided by however much was assigned to each of them. Now, for everything that is not been assigned, because you can assign up to 100% maximum value, but for everything that you don't assign, it ends up here in the fixed column. So in this particular example, you can see that the time independent cost is, is zero because actually 25% plus 20 plus 25 plus 10 plus 20 adds up to 100. So I actually apportioned all of the design house con, um, costs uh, to those activities. So but in the in the line item above that says PMO um, and I've got a sort of beta per distribution but you can see here that I've given it to a hammock which lasts for the duration of the whole project and I've then assigned 80% of the cost to be uh, variable so that you can see that 20% therefore is landing here in the time independent so there's a fixed upfront cost of 400 grand that is just spent it's, and it's not going to change, but the 1.6 is, is variable. And it's that variable portion that is used as part of the auto calculation for the day rate. So 1.6 million divided by the 530 days deterministic duration of the hammock, which is the whole length of the project. Um, and then you get £3,000 per day or £3,019 per day. So that means that as you Monte Carlo this, um, for every day beyond 530 days, it's going to cost the project an extra free grand per day but if there was opportunities and you come in at maybe one day early you'll save three thousand pounds for that day so that's broadly how that is working out and calculating so you've got kind of time independent and time dependent cost um and it, it's probably the easiest way of doing it and doing it very quickly i found it quite intuitive to do when i first came across this um, so I mean, anecdotally, I, I wandered over to the cost estimators desk and they had a very high level uh, cost breakdown structure, which I was able to manually recreate in Saffron within 20 minutes or so. And then I began proportioning and pro ratering different things with no particular you know, knowledge necessarily, but I was able to take a very good guess with my understanding of the project as, as I did uh, and then start running Monte Carlo with a fully integrated um, model and then generating insights of where is cost really coming from on this project when schedule drives additional cost and such like. Um, incidentally, as a bit of an aside, you can actually have it the other way. Your cost model through correlation can actually drive the schedule as well. It goes both ways, uh, which is something I have tested and it does work. So I think we've covered that. Can't total greater than 100% of what's available and anything less counts as fixed. So that's good. Right. When in time are costs incurred? So if you use the method shown, pretty much it will default to using the activities you've assigned it to. So that that histogram at the bottom of the orange portion is showing you that, you know, the design house is here in time because you can see there's another toggle at the bottom of the screen that says use dates from activities in the schedule connection. This here is the schedule connection. So if you toggled that on, then that's easy and it's just automatically calculates and that's the default. However, you can override it. You could untoggle that and then click one of these buttons here um, that says uh, fix the date in time. So maybe there's an upfront point in time when you know you're going to purchase that really expensive piece of equipment. It, you know, it's like a non-negotiable. It's just going to happen. There's, there's nothing that's going to stop it. It won't move around in time, depending on other factors on the project. Uh, so if, if you're that confident, you could fix it in place. Um, alternatively, you can stipulate when in time the cost will be incurred, but according to a different activity um, to the ones that you've made the connection on. So maybe there's something else that is driving the when in time. So maybe there's a payment milestone you want to link it to or something like that. I'm not sure. It's entirely up to you, but you've got the freedom to kind of um, decouple or de-link these things. So, you know, it, it, it's 
I guess it's something I would encourage you to play with. So you open up some of those demo files and just run the Monte Carlo, see what it does, then come back here, change some of the settings, change where you've linked it or fixing it in time and see how that affects where, where the spread of cost goes. Um, it's worth pointing out though at the bottom of the screen that just says cost elements. They'll, they'll actually default to inherit whatever instruction you've given them uh, from the parent node on the cost breakdown structure. So what I mean by that is you can click on the parent node and say when in time will all materials be purchased and you can say well they'll be purchased in March next year and that's it and then any cost element you have underneath the materials um, bar or node will automatically inherit that unless you put a schedule connection in which will then potentially overwrite that so th there is other sort of default things that will go on in the background as well um, so I've mentioned already that this will move around with the step through, but if you're interested in what's called probabilistic cash flow, there is a separate um, output on the black ribbon on the right hand side um, called PCF, probabilistic cash flow, which will give you the Monte Carlo or uh, I guess you might call it the risk adjusted cost position or cash flow uh, rather than the deterministic. So what you see on screen is deterministic, but once you've run a Monte Carlo, maybe you want to see a P80 position instead of that because you know it's going to move. So if you want to see where the peaks and troughs of, of expenditure are going to be or how high are the peaks after the deterministic end date, you know, how long is the project going to run for and what does that look like each month? Um, you can do that. But there's an example here where actually if you click on a cost element, there's a sub tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, it says base calculation there. I think this is an older screenshot. This def definitely says formula now, I'm sure of it. Uh, and the formula allows you to create a base price or a quantity based on whatever you write in the formula. And to do, for, let's actually dip into the tool. This will be a little easier, more intuitive for you. <clears throat> let's find that same one, um, legal costs. Right, so if I go to, yeah, it's called formulas under the latest version. So you can see here I've got a kind of, I'm going to just call this, it says the references, but I think of this more as like a, a menu or an ingredients list. And then you create those in here and then you create a symbol. So this is what I want them to be referred to as under the formula. So I've got this kind of legal cost from my variable table, which is a triangular distribution with a most likely of £5,000 per day. I then call it legal F as the symbol. If I call that legal fees, it breaks the formula as I've written it because legal F is no longer recognised. So this is just a bit of validation to help you understand um, if what's working, what's not working. If it accepts it, it then changes the colour of it to help you track and understand this. So I've got legal fees of 5,000 a day, could be a bit more, could be a bit less, multiplied by open brackets, activity reference A0110, and the duration thereof. So you can see here that I've linked in from the activity selection, so I could have picked any activity from the, the selection there. Um, and it's got a duration or deterministic duration of eight days. So that's going creating a 5,000 per day multiplied by eight, so that's 40,000, but then my formula says then add 10 more thousand pounds for disbursement fees. So that gives you a grand total of 50 grand. You can see up here it's written that in 50 grand and it's greyed out, so I can't actually edit that 50 grand. I can edit it down here in the formula, I can put like, and one more pound and it's now 50,001. So that's how you can also create a like a schedule connection or a time dependent uh, connection of cost. Um, yes, yeah, so like, like the £10,000 is always going to be £10,000, but the duration may stretch or shrink and therefore the legal fee, which might also be higher or lower than £5,000, depending on the Monte Carlo sampling. So there's a, a lot going on there and you've got a lot of finesse, a lot of control, and you could do something similar with the quantity as well if the quantities are uncertain. I should probably open up the variables table just so you can see what's going on in there. <clears throat> if you click on that, I mentioned that you can do kind of what if scenarios and things like that. 
I mean, I've got, um, let's have a look. We've got the, the legal costs we just, just talked about a moment ago, £5,000 a day is the base price. And then I've described it here as a triangle. Other distributions are available, of course. Um, maybe it's a financial year uplift. And then I use the formulas to link and say, if this happens or if this threshold or trigger is met, then randomly select a percentage to increase the costs by. So it could be 3%, 4% or 10% and I've created a, a probabilistic chance that it will be any of those free outcomes. So these are kind of simple what if scenarios that you could test in the cost model um, and then send the, the output through to your distribution comparison for, for later, um, comparing against other scenarios and things. Um, and I did also mention earlier about penalty fees. So here's an example. Best, best best guess penalty fees. We know we're going to have them. We've had them in the past with our customers, but we haven't entered into contract yet. So we don't know what they're going to be. We can guess what they're going to be. So we've created a, a variable which says it could be a hundred pounds a day. It could be two and a half thousand pounds a day. We're not really sure, but here's the formula. So you describe the, um, the you know, in, in the kind of the menu, the ingredients list, the things that are in question, you add them in here. So I'm looking now at this particular activity dot early finish. If that early finish exceeds this date, then start applying this or multiplying by that delay penalty. And I, furthermore, I can, I've done something here with the quantity formula that says, and if I go into the following financial year, double the delay penalty. And what we can do with our scatter plot as an output is just check and see if that formula is even working and behaving. So that's something that can be done. So I'm just going to move things on a bit because I can see the, the time is getting on for nearly four o'clock and we haven't even run a Monte Carlo yet. But we, we've pretty much gone through uh, all of the input uh, tabs apart from correlation. Uh, if you want me to, I, I, I will do that. But just while we're talking about correlation, there's a little toggle here on the options. You can include the matrix or not. Again, a soft what if an, um, analysis or comparison between whether you've got them on or off. You may, may be of interest to you. But the principal things you're going to be doing in this screen is selecting which elements from your risk register are or are not included in the the, the simulation, whether they're going to be a pre-mitigated or post-mitigated positions or a blend therein or there. Um, so that could be useful to you. Um, <clears throat> the grey boxes that are around some of those risks, notice this is the opportunity that we got, a uh, design specification we looked at on one of the slides earlier, which was uh, where we had the mitigation with the um, the optioneering presentation, but we had it as an alternate position based on action. So these three grey boxes represent all of those places where the mitigation measure drives if it is a pre or it is a post mitigated position. So if I, want, if I don't want to see a grey box there, I have to go back to the risk register and untoggle that. I've then got how many thousands of iterations, whether I want to use convergence uh, thresholds, and I can set those. Um, whether to anchor around a certain seed value, use Latin hypercube, include correlation matrix on or off, resource leveling after each iteration if you have a resource loaded schedule, and of course the step through, which we'll definitely be doing. So those are all the things that are in play, but before I hit go and run the analysis, I just explain the focus activities and costs. This allows you, um, this is very relevant to me on my last project where let's say I had my 16,000 schedule, the contract had 70 key date milestones which, which were contractual and then of those 70 maybe 20 of them were tangibly important or agreed as the most important ones so I might want to create a little short list of those milestones of those 20 in here without having to memorize all of the ID numbers and references from the schedule itself this creates a little short list which means later on when you explore it's easier to track maybe do it as a as a workshop and you know everyone can sort of slickly see you navigating between the, the the objectives that matter rather than drilling down various hierarchy trees and trying to find the, the ones in question um, and once you've selected all the things that are important to you then you're going to hit your analysis and this will be fairly familiar territory to you uh, with respect to you know, hitting the next step and then being able to see the Monte Carlo have an effect on the schedule. What I've done with this layout 
is that I've anchored in place with this kind of grey bar the deterministic schedule. So I can see just how much of an effect the, the Monte Carlo or the, the risks are actually having uh, against that. And I've also created uh, a, a computed field which is displaying in the yellow triangle. So not only is it showing me which risks are impacting on each of given iteration, it's showing me uh, how much by, what's the delta. Uh, so if there's opportunities like this, it'll come up as negative 24 and so forth. And if there are risks, uh, there'd be big impacts potentially. So this is useful in helping you understand the behavior of your model and if it is working the way you in intended. Um, I won't really sort of labor the point, but what I will do is I just quickly go into the cost model just to show you that this is all uh, happening here too. So if I was to go to say, I don't know, material uh, cost, um, no, other labor, there you are, labor costs. So if you want to see where labor costs are being spent or incurred as part of the step through analysis and how much buy, you can see that that all moves around as well. And if you scroll this over to the right, wherever the risks have been mapped, you can see those lighting up and changing as well. So all the various details and then the final iteration value. So this is all again doing exactly the same thing to help you understand whether or not it's behaving as you intended. And once you're satisfied that the schedule and the cost model are doing uh, what you need them to, and I should also point out that you could just run the cost model without a schedule. You don't have to always have a schedule there. You could just run this with cost. Uh, once you're happy, hit complete. And it'll take you straight to your first sort of default output. Which will be should be the histogram and S curve. Sometimes it goes into the raw data view if you left that up last time you were you were there. Um, so familiar territory for most of you uh, with a Monte Carlo background. Uh, I mentioned you've got your finish date, start date, duration, cost, uh, outputs from the schedule. You want to see the cost module or cost breakdown structure. Click on this button and look at labor costs or look at whatever it is. PMO design house so you can drill down as necessary into either of those elements. You can set targets which will draw a new arrow on the, the graph um, and add it into the st st statistics window in the, on the right hand side. So we can see things like we've got the deterministic 280,000, the probability of achieving that is P32 and so forth. So there's all the sort of usual things there. But what I quite like is that this is all fairly interactive uh, in terms of the, the legend. So you don't like the colors, obviously go with different colors. You can change those under the options cog. No, no problem with that. Um, but what you can do is if you don't want to see the histogram, just untoggle it from the legend. So you can layer on as many of these things as you like. Um, the big colorful blocks in the background are what we call curtains. So you define uh, under the options cog, what are the percentiles, the focus percentiles that you're interested in? Is it P50 or P75 or whatever it might be? And then once you've defined those, you can then draw curtains to show the, the calculation of between the, the or the delta between the deterministic P50, P50 to the P80, P80, P90 and so forth. So that might be the subcontractors uh, uh, proportion of the contingency. This might be the project managers. That might be the overall client. You know, that could be a, a user case for that kind of thing. But you can set as many focus percentiles as you like. So I've got P1 and P100 because I'm actually interested in looking at the overall volatility sometimes between uh, models and on, on risks and things. Um, but I guess I'll let you explore that for yourselves in terms of what you can do, but most of it is to, you know, colour and what you see and what you don't see. Uh, and you've got the curtains here and just hit the add button and you can sort of draw in as many as you need. Um, if you hit the export button, you're pretty much going to get either just the graph or graph and the table or the raw data and the percentiles. So you've got a few different options there. Um, there's if you want to see raw data, not in an Excel spreadsheet, but in another way, um, we have this button here for the data view, uh, which gives you every single um, iteration. So I've run 2000 iterations. Here they all are. Finish dates, start dates, uh, duration. That is the cost embedded within the schedule. So if you want to see the cost, you'd have to click on the cost tab again and then you get the, the actual CBS and you can see this uh, breakdown structure has changed one more time. So you can actually click on any particular part of that breakdown structure and look at just those things and see how uh, things did or did not affect those. 
Um, I'm just going to go back to the schedule though, because what you can do in here is pretty neat. You can, let's say, resort by shortest duration. So you click here. So you might recall we had 530 days deterministic. So the best out of 2000 iterations that we ever had was 552 days. If you want to see what that looks like, you can actually hyperlink in and click and see that version of the step through. Uh, you can see here that virtually no risks happened uh, and the ones that did happen weren't to a terribly severe magnitude. If you scroll uh, around and down, you'll, you'll find red boxes for risk, green boxes for opportunities. Like there's a green one hover over, get the schedule impact uh, so you can understand what did and didn't happen. But what's more interesting to me personally is if I resort to the other end of the spectrum, so I'm now up at the um, double the deterministic. So the deterministic has virtually got doubled to about a thousand or more days. I can see what conspired together to create that worst case scenario or this P100 type scenario. I can see um, also as I scroll down and I look what squares or which risks fired on or tend to fire on during worst case scenarios. So this gives me some indication as to what might be typically at play uh, in a bad day at the office. Um, it can lead to more questions like how do I make these particular combinations of risks not occur at the same time? You know, talking about that complexity theory you know, again, uh, you know, how do you decouple uh, things remove their kind of cascade or domino effect between one another. Um, so, you know, opens up new avenues of investigation. But just so you can see it, if I click that iteration hyperlink, what is a what is the baddest day in the office look like? It's this one here. There's my deterministic. There's my P80 risk adjusted, and there on the far right is just how bad it could have got. And that as a visualization might be super helpful when you want to just focus the minds of people. You could, um, let's, let's just close that. If you were to right click in here and hit assign fields, you can create a formula, um, which I've probably already done in the past, to be fair, if I scroll down, I've saved them in the past. Um, like you can set a formula so it picks up a value from the P80 and sends it to a user field. So you can send it to an empty user field. So you, you know how you might have 20 or so dormant, like if you go to reference, text, date, flag, decimals, duration. So you might pick a duration, mm. like I've used one here in the past. I probably used that, it says I've renamed it as well from duration one to deterministic. This is how I created my uh, gray bars was I'm anchoring the gray bars against this thing here. This will not change. I can multicolor it until I'm blue in the face, but nine will always be nine until someone overwrites it with another value manually. So that will always stay in place, but you could do right click, assign field, set a formula, pick the P80 duration, send it to uh, an empty, not being used user field, export via the file, Remember I showed you export, export project, send as an XER, and then that user field, like duration two, you tell them to import that or copy and paste from that into their P6 schedule. Um, and then they they can overwrite or create a kind of what if scenario in there. So yeah, dead easy. And I'm actually showing that duration is that's the number that's being shown on the, the, the Gantt chart, by the way. So 50 day P80 duration for that final task uh, deterministic was 40 days. So, OK, um, so that's some cool stuff that you can do. And I kind of tend to talk about that in terms of being like a detective mode um, when you're in the data view and, you know, jumping in and around. It just helps you find those needles in a haystack a bit faster. It's like bringing a magnet and understanding, you know, why is things doing this? Is, is this an anomaly and we need to fix it? Or is this a real life? This could really happen, you know, really focus the minds. <clears throat> OK, um, drivers. So the, the next place you tend to come to after getting a kind of typical histogram S curve is your drivers. So this is using a correlation coefficient to rank order the the magnitude of the uh, the influence that one thing is having on another thing um which is great for very quick um what is the worst thing 
that's going on and you'll all be familiar with that and if you're anything like me you've probably also been in a situation where your stakeholder or your project director has then said that's wonderful chris but I already knew that that was going to be the top risk because I told you it was a higher probability and high impact event. I've learned nothing. How much is it going to actually impact me by is the obvious next question, which is what sensitivity analysis is in Safran risk. So it sort of evolves the concept. But before I show you sensitivity analysis, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we've done here in Safran that it just actually improves this a little bit more, which is you recall we had the duration uncertainty low medium and high on the risk register and because we have it on the risk register it means that on the risk uh, tornado graph i've now got my discrete risk events and things but also du high when mapped against activity or it's pinpointed against locating subcontractors and suppliers like we observed previously on the risk mapping screen this is actually within my top what six certainly within my top 10 uh, risks. Now that was not articulated as a risk, but the modelling has shown it to be a risk. So it's it's now something that I'm aware of that I wasn't aware of before, and it could have very big ramifications, particularly if you're in like oil and gas, and you you think that you have to get everything built onshore where it's going to be cheaper before move, exporting to offshore. So you put in a bunch of risks, but then you fail to recognise the estimating uncertainty effect and where they might actually have been your biggest risks all along. And this is the kind of thing that would have helped you find that out and save you millions and millions of pounds in that kind of setting, perhaps. So I just like flagging that as a, as a neat function that we have there. Um, but if you need to, you can go into the cost model. Uh, maybe you want to go straight into materials or something and investigate. And you've got uh, the power here under this tornado from the cost model to look at everything together or just the cost from the cost model, what's influencing it the most, or the activity schedule, how's that driving cost, or the risks just, just from the risk register. So there's, there's, an, there's a nice little um, spread of functions there that enriches the experience of trying to track down and understand model behaviour. Um, but as I said, it's really when you want to evolve the concept further, you go to the sensitivity analysis. So just to explain what this is, um, you may have already done this in your your previous projects yourselves. This is essentially where you are asked the question, but how much is that affecting me by? So you go, well, I don't know. I have to rerun the model, but this time without the risk on. Therefore, I'll be able to measure the delta. So if I was looking at P80 previously, I'll remodel it, but without that risk and see what the P80 now looks like and whatever the delta is, that's the answer. Um, so this automatically does that for you. So if we put this on to you know, cost, we'll have it on S curves. So I'm interested in the overall project and the overall project cost at P80 value. I then hit calculate impact. So the first thing you'll see is a black S curve. That's the one we've already just seen. That's the cumulative, all the risks switched on. But what it's doing now is it's reimagining what life would have looked like had one of those risks not been there. So do you remember on the risk register, each risk was assigned an, a unique color. That's where this comes in. You will now see lots of different colors for each risk being turned off and you can see how far back it moves in the uh, from the, 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 the overall position of all risks being switched on. And you could have done this like for me, I, I certainly did one of my last projects where it took me the best part of a week or more because uh, we had very, quite a lot of risks uh, and using PRA wasn't the easiest. Uh, having to create lots of extra files and things, it really slows you down and of course introduces human error in the process. But here I just hit a button and a, a, you know, a few moments later I've now got this. So I can see that as S curves, I can turn off and on uh, individual things. So I just want to see what's the weather one look like compared to the, the original baseline. You know, that, that's the effect the weather risk was having on my testing phase. Um, and what does that look like in terms of uh, P80 schedule impact? Well, the answer is 38 days at P80 confidence or £272,000 in terms of cost and interrelated cost because you've got to remember I've got a, a fully integrated cost and schedule model so if there was anything like the hiring of the airfield which is dependent on the you know that's where we're doing the testing so the testing phase takes longer we hire the airfield for longer so if the wind blows it takes longer so there's costs that are related there okay so again all of those kinds of things um, 
automatically filtered through in this view. Uh, it was very useful. And if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you can see the on the tabular form, though, uh, you can see the outsourcing opportunity that uh, we, we talked briefly about on one of the slides. And what's the if you, if you remember the opportunity, I think was a five thousand pound upfront investment and additional five days of time. Well, I'm actually net effect. I'm actually saving four days overall, despite an investment, you know, taking five more days. It feels like it's going to slow me down, but actually outsourcing it was a smart thing to do because of the big time savings elsewhere. Uh, and furthermore, that five grand, well, it converted into 122,000 of savings. So this is because I use that blended approach of pre and post mitigated in the same model. I can now learn that. Whereas I couldn't have done that if I was doing, or I couldn't have done it as easily with pre and, and then post separate models. But clearly you can do either or, but um, just demonstrating the, the capability, I guess. Um, similar to this, actually, if you were to then change, what are you focusing on the project? Um, if you were to go to project, I'm interested in the design phase instead. And um, what's really impacting the design phase? Now, I saw this the first time and I thought this was a bug, I have to admit, but it's not. This here tells me that my second uh, biggest problem is the air transport re required risk. Now, thematically, this makes no sense whatsoever. Why air transport, once I've created my product and I'm shipping it to my client at the end or my customer at the end of the project, why has that got anything to do with finalizing the design? And it wasn't until I went back to the developers and I, I, I investigated with them and they pointed out that what I'd done is because I was using the alternate position based on action toggle, blending my pre and my post mitigation together, meant that the post mitigated costs of mitigating the air transport risk, which meant upfront cost or investment to mitigate against it, to guarantee a booking of some extra trucks on the road or whatever it might have been, that was actually coming through and affecting the design phase because or because if you think about it sequentially, this is something that we deal with or the mitigation is proposed and dealt with during procurement, which is in advance of finishing the design uh, in this particular fictional project. Um, so that also might have some useful connotations for you uh, as well. Um, so I'd just like to point that out. Um, you can show it as a tornado if you prefer, and if you go into the options cog, you could also uh, show the cost and the schedule tornadoes kind of in the same graphic. But you've got a table here on the left hand side. You can kind of click in here, hold down shift, copy, paste into Excel, and you can start manipulating somewhere else if you want to make a different looking report. But it's very useful information because you can now talk to people in the language of business, you know, delay and cost and such like um, at a certain confidence level. It'll pass because it's much faster. Um, oh, um, I was just saying uh, the single pass method is reusing the existing 2000 iteration Monte Carlo we did originally. But if you wanted to get a more granular, more accurate answer, maybe before a final submission, and I, I, I really recommend that you would only do this in that situation, you would go to multiple pass method. And what that's going to do is it will do the single pass method first, which gives the computer system an understanding of the rank order. It then understands which order to then remove the risks in rather than in a random order. It will now take them off in this particular order. And when it does that, it will then re-simulate a new 2000 iteration Monte Carlo on top of so that it helps refine and increase the accuracy of the output, um, which means that all of the P80 values, if you were to sum them together, should total closer to the actual cumulative P80 um that you see on the on the original output um so there's more variation uh, at the moment with a single pass um and i appreciate that if you've got 200 risk on your risk register then that's basically the same thing as saying run 201 monte carlos so you might not want to do that so under the multiple pass options you can say actually let's just focus on the uncertainties that matter, you know, the 80-20 rule. So maybe we just want to run the top 20 risks with multiple pass methods rather than, you know, all of them. So just, just little things like that will uh, help you save a bit of time. Um, but for day-to-day -day stuff, um, you just want to see, get a quick rough and ready, what's, what's, it, what's it doing now? 
single pass is probably sufficient for your needs. OK, um, so moving through to the scatter plot. So the scatter plot, uh, let's change that view for one moment. This will help explain it. For those that haven't seen the scatter plot before, essentially, you because we're running two simulations, it's te technically it's a single simulation, but with a, a cost variable and a schedule variable, it means that you can plot these side by side and you can determine what's going on each axis. So you've got an X and Y axis. You can say, well, uh, I could have finished date, but maybe let's just, it's easier to understand it as a duration. So it redraws it as duration. I can now see I've got my 530 days deterministic all the way through to it doubling to about a thousand or, or more uh, days. So this is maybe an easier way of describing it. Uh, and then your other axis is cost. And what you can do, the default is going to be to use the deterministic. OK, so let's just stick these on. So the deterministic is being used. The deterministic is a star symbol on this scatter plot. And it's all the way down here in the bottom left corner. So that's the 530 days and the whatever the uh, deterministic cost was, 10.99 million, as shown in the stats window. And <clears throat> So if we were to start talking about contingency and where should we pitch it, someone might say add 10%. So they might just untoggle the use deterministic so they can now change this and go, let's go for 583 days. This redraws one part of the crosshair and then you could do similar on the other and then you could add uh, an amount of cost and you might come up with a figure. Uh, lick finger, wag in the air, and then go, oh, that's just terrible. Uh, that's not sufficient at all. You can see we've got a few green dots have now appeared. So we've nudged it along a little bit, but actually the chance or the probability statistically of ending inside this, this window or quadrant is basically 0%. So out of 2,000 sampled, we're just not ever going to get this. So you might then say, OK, Chris, but where should we pitch the contingency? You know, how, how do we do that? Do we just pick the centre of the cloud, for instance? No, no, you don't. What you can do is use something called JCL, Joint Confidence Level. So this is the statistical probability or p-value of achieving both your targets, so both your cost target and your schedule target. So what we can do to help ourselves is if we click this and go back to uh, changing the colour scheme from target values to JCL bands. So instead of it being kind of red is good, sorry, uh, green is good, red is bad, it's now giving us a few different colours. So do you remember I used the options cog to choose my focus percentiles and I said P1 through to P100. So I'm now getting those up here and so P P1, so this is not 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 great. Um, you know, this is where we're currently pitching our contingency. There's like hardly any chance that that will succeed whatsoever because many more of the scatter plots all ended up outside of those thresholds. Say we're interested in P80. So if I wanted to give a P80 value and redraw the crosshair, I would do so by looking at the color first of all and saying, well, okay, the P80 appears to be orange through to red. So it's this liminal zone where orange and red sort of buffer up against one another. And you can see that that roughly creates a, a C or a, a curve shape, which means that if I hover over any plot, I can see that I get which iteration did that come from? What was the X coordinate time, Y coordinate cost? And what was the joint confidence level of pitching that as the contingency is P83. OK, that's maybe a little too high, but it's roughly the ballpark of P80. OK, so I can go all the way over here and be approximately P80. And similarly, I can go up this end of the, the curve and also be about P80. So this one's P81. Um, I could maybe drop it there, P78. So you, you can kind of have high cost, sorry, high confidence in one aspect over the other, just because it, when you redraw the crosshair, um, to, to that point, the number of iterations out of the 2000 would be the you know 80% of them. So if you're looking to optimize and have a kind of argument free discussion, effectively what you're looking for is the inflection point of the curve somewhere in the kind of the center of the curve like this. And then you would pitch that and say, OK, can, can we all agree that we're going to at least go for 
as like there's a p80 value just there so we're going to go for 783 days and 17.2 million so 783 days and 7138 one three eight so that'll redraw that crosshair x-axis I've forgotten already it's seven eight three so I've now got um okay that was close not quite right but 79 so I'm effectively p79 or as a JCL joint confidence level so if there was a rationale why did you pick here it's because it was kind of the optimal point of not being more favoring cost overrun than schedule overrun and vice versa it was kind of the optimal point but it just reframes the discussion reframes the debate um, and gives you another tool to to do so what you can also do is if we put it back on our cost if we go to other costs so do you remember we had the penalty fee that kicks in after a certain point and it could be a hundred pounds a day delay penalty so that would be bottom of this cone shape it could be two and a half thousand pounds per day which would be the top end of the cone shape and anywhere in between so that's the random sort of triangular distribution that we had and then the quantity formula doubled it so if it went into the following financial year it doubles so i can see that the quantity formula then explodes into life and then you know spreads uh, the range open so this just gives me some confidence that the formula that i created is working and behaving as i as i intended um, so there's little things you can do here uh, to look at specific parts of your model, not just the overall project, but you can look and see if there's things that are, are, are correlated, you know, between uh, one another as well. So <clears throat> let's uh, put that back to where it was. OK, um, so I'll just talk about probabilistic cash flow briefly. So I've got this set to look at my cost module because that's where my costs are actually built in this case. Um, I could look at any individual part, but I'll just happily keep it on the overall project. Um, and then you can see again, you've got the legend, which is interactive. So I can switch on and off any of my focus percentiles, my P1 and whatnot. Uh, but I'm actually interested in P80. So I've got my P80 selected. I'm also interested in my cumulative curves, uh, deterministic curves. So that's not drawn very nicely. I think there is under the options legend location. Let's put that to the top left. So you can see what I've got selected here. I could unpin all these things if I wanted to fill the screen up. Um, and I've also got a scatter plot drawn on here as well. Some people might find that useful. You can turn that off if you don't like it. It's, again, legend is interactive. Um, but now I can see the gray bars represent how much we expected deterministically to in, you know, how much cost would we incur at any given time and then the p80 uh, risk adjusted position of that cash flow so i can see that it peaks at somewhat higher in certain months in fact probably all months but also where the project is supposed to be coming to an end you know towards these uh, months at the end of the project here the gray bars are shrinking down in size but actually after the risks have been applied and the estimating uncertainties actually the project continues at you know some rate uh, and the testing phase goes on because of weather and testing glitches and things we end up hiring the airfield for longer and you can see that cumulative cost or p80 position cost here and then it shrinks off so it gives you an idea of uh, how what that spend profile looks like probabilistically speaking and if you need to you can hit this button here again for data view and it will bring you up uh, the, the, you know the each period um, how much cost was incurred deterministically versus the p18 and whatnot and you can see that as cumulative or um, periodic you can change you can show that in days weeks whatever you need to and it'll just recalculate that so maybe you need to see this as quarters perhaps or something like that or maybe your user case is that you have a funding limit that you know you're only going to be able to spend maybe a million pounds in a, a given period so it would be interesting to use this view to then see which points peak above that one million threshold um, so it's all kinds of things that you might want to uh, do with this 
I'll move into distribution comparison then. So as was stated very early on at the very start, the Safran Risk is a database, which means that you can add as many of these reports through this button here, add report, and you get loads of these little sort of tiles and you can create these for um, like formal purposes, like it could be every month I'm going to run a Monte Carlo and just save what the S curve looked like each month, and you can then trend it like like you saw a moment ago, uh, flashed up on screen. Or maybe you just need to run a, a, a what if scenario. What if a scope and we don't be um, so that content there's no upper limit as i understand it on how many s curves you can put into any given report and you can have lots and lots of reports as well uh, but if you were to open up and look at one of these you can see here i've got lots and lots and lots and lots of s curves all in this one single report i'm trending that over time just by this button at the top i can take that off and i can just have them as s curves side by side trending mode might be the, the thing that is most helpful though um, you know, this might be useful in helping tell a story as well. I mean, I've got another example uh, for trending. This one here is good. So in this example, what I've done is every time I've sent an S curve into the distribution comparison, I've been very disciplined and I renamed the curve to explain exactly what has changed about the model before I run the model. So this is where someone was saying, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Can you help me? And I'm refining their model for them. And I'm saying, OK, well, we're dealing with the COVID question. Now we're dealing with the equipment modeling question. Now we're dealing with a different question and so forth. Well, now we're changing the subcontract or removing someone uh, and the weather risk. And you can see that the P1 to the P100 almost is like a box and whisker kind of diagram now. Uh, and they're kind of closing in as, as time moves on. And I'm improving, refining the quality of the model, the underlying schedule logic. And then I then say, OK, but what about what's missing? What what needs to be added in? And then you can see that the uncertainty or the volatility starts creeping up again. So again, it tells a narrative, it tells a story. There's space notes. The table information is quite useful because you can anchor it against a particular thing. So the typical user case is, of course, pre-mitigated versus post-mitigated versus no risks, just the estimating uncertainty. Um, you could look at finish dates, you could look at cost, but you can use the table information to say, I'm interested in the P80 and I want to anchor it and compare it against just duration uncertainty alone. What's the delta? What's the difference between that and that? And it will just automatically calculate it for you on the table. So that gives you a broad cost benefit analysis um, or improved, you know, what's the net improvement, net position? It's a little bit of stats that's also captured under uh, in this little bottom window here as well when you click on each curve. And you can share these as well. Um, I'm assuming you'd be able to peek into one another's because um, you're on the same server, I think, or will be set up on the same server. But if not, then you'd be able to share them, export the graphs and things, import and export. Um, but yeah, largely for me, I think the benefit here is that you can create these kind of what if scenarios. Like I've got this one here, the how many drones scenario. So I mentioned about our customer, they're going to order an uncertain number of drones. The minimum they, they can order is 10,000 units. Um, so I'm interested in comparing against the minimum order and then I can re-rank uh, the information. And so as you can see, I've rerun the model with 12,000 units, 14, 16, 18, up to a maximum of 20,000 units. That's the maximum we can supply. And I can see the delta at the P80 cost increasing by this much as we add on more and more thousands of units. So that's more and more uh, materials required to create the drones, and, but it's also going to be higher labor cost, longer duration to assemble them all, etc. So I get that there. I've also got the duration um, sent in as well. And what I quite like about this is that once you've created those standalone scenarios, I then said, OK, but what about a scenario where I don't know how many units? So if, if that's the scenario where I knew it was 12,000 or 14,000, what if it was anywhere in between 10 and 20? So I created a distribution on the variable table. I then used the correlation matrix. I uh, you know, related it to various uh, things on the cost model as well as the risk register and was able to then create this new curve 
which is this thick blue one that's now shown over there, which now intersects perfectly the P80 of the 14,000 units. So if I was to tell my senior team what to plan for, I would say plan for 14,000, you know, probabilistically speaking, a P80 confidence, that, that one's the one to go for based on what we know. So, you know, this is the power of sort of storytelling now is when you start layering in these what ifs and changing the scope or changing something about the modelling and whether they're correlated or not correlated, the risk is mitigated or not. You can use this as a visualisation to enhance that and start making recommendations to your stakeholders who in turn can then say, thank you for giving me useful information. I can now, uh, you know, make a sensible decision based on this rather than just you telling me what the top 10 risks were, which I probably knew what they were already because I already told you what the information was. So, you know, it changes the emphasis and focus of the conversation with stakeholders and should uplift the value of the kind of the risk modeling uh, process and team. OK. I'll move to critical path and that, that pretty much will conclude the, the training I think unless there's any final questions. So <clears throat> the purpose of uh, the critical path map is to offer an alternative method to exploring near critical paths. So the first thing that you'll see or should see is if you have more than one critical path or near critical path uh, they'll show down here after you've run a simulation. So I've got path one, two, three, four, five, six, and of 2000 iterations, the sequence of events of path one was adopted, or the sequence of events in path two were adopted 34% of the time and so forth. So I can see which one's my most stable path. And that's the first thing. The second thing is I can sort of step through. I don't have to, that is defaulting to the overall project, but maybe I'm interested in what gets me to the finalizing of design. So if I click that, it will reorganize the information on the screen and show me just the activities leading up to that milestone. Okay, so that's quite important. Now, the first thing I learn is path one is used 100% or adopted 100% of the time. That sequence will always occur. And that's perfectly accurate, it's perfectly correct because it's a very simple project, there's only 30 or so activities. I know that the deviation in the project where the paths may split actually come towards the fabrication or construction phase of the project. Um, so as we step through and go to say this one here, paths one, two and three now open up. So I can spot quite clearly where the, um, uh, the paths are div diverging. Uh, if I just move these windows around a little bit, change that from years. <clears throat> Let's put that quarters. So that will fit it all on the screen a bit better. Um, but you can see here that you get the activity information, the criticality. So the, it's essentially the same thing. What's the frequency that it was on critical path? Um, and you get a little Gantt chart view. And just to help or, or an alternative view of it is that you can see on the Gantt chart here that you've got the activities, what path on and then if you spot a gap drop down and you can see the paths and these are the splits so it's just another visual way of doing it and then on the right hand side and this is pretty much the last thing is the <clears throat> the path plot so this s curve looking diagram the important uh, axis is this one here duration so this means if i just turn off some of those paths so we're just looking at path number one. So 48% of the time, this is the sequence that is adopted after being stressed by all the risks and uncertainties. And actually path one, what I've learned is that it can be really long duration at the top right corner here. It can also be very short duration and it can also be everywhere in between. So that means that path is pretty robust, I would say. Um, and I might look at a different path. Let's look at path three. And path three is kind of similar and it's maybe a little bit uh, longer uh, duration, but also we've got some it's short duration and everywhere pretty much in between. But when you run this on a real life schedule, you might find clusters or pockets where some paths are longer than others just as a feature or as, a, you know, as part of their nature. So you get to explore a little bit about the, the paths themselves. Uh, and how they compare against others, which might open up a few other options of conversations, such as how do we encourage path number seven 
to occur because we quite like path seven. It looks really stable. It keeps occurring here in the path plot, you know, something like that. But what we've heard from some of our other customers is that when they've been using this, it's helped them spot anomalies. So you see down here where it says paths five and six, one percent, zero percent. So just a few of the random iterations has ended up in a completely different sequence of events and you start investigating it and then you realize actually that's an anomaly of the logic that doesn't make sense so despite doing schedule checks schedule warnings and all this kind of validation and stuff actually something like this might pick up a few other oddities that might need correcting or you learn something new and go oh that, that's that that can happen <laughs> and then you know you can, might want to report on that so but uh, there we are i think i think that pretty much concludes what I can fit in the time and we've managed to get from left to right on the, the black ribbon. Um, but don't forget the sample data, burger menu, top right corner, open yeah. user log file, and you just drill down a few from risk sample data, and then you've got a few project files. And remember that's importing a .spx, that's the schedule file, then this one here would be the risk model. You've got to have both parts, otherwise you just got a schedule with no risks, you know. Mm -hmm.